Today's episode is brought to you by the Bose S1 Pro Multi-Position PA System and WestFloridaRealEstate.com. Hey everybody, this is Craig Garber. Welcome to Everyone Loves Guitar. Man, we got a really interesting, really cool guest today with Tony Phillips. He's a very successful mixing engineer, originally from Texas, as you'll hear him talking in a minute. No, I'm just kidding. He's from <laughs> England. Uh, quick uh, few messages. Uh, number one, shout out to Doug Bossy. Your wing here at the Everyone Loves Guitar compound is growing. Uh, Doug's the friend of mine, a mutual friend of Tony and I, and uh, hooked us up and put it together. And thanks for all your ongoing support, Doug. Uh, number two, go to everyonelovesguitar.com forward slash subscribe, and you can subscribe to the show on both YouTube and uh, wherever you subscribe to podcasts. And lastly, Carlos Santana, Joe Wallace. I'm really excited, looking forward to having those guys on the show. If somebody listening can connect us, that would be very cool. All right, let's talk about Tony Phillips. Born in East London, Tony spent most of, his, most of his youth playing in a variety of rock bands, ultimately becoming the lead vocalist, bass player, and principal songwriter for A&M recording artist Horizontal Brian, which is the coolest. It's like a, It seems something very intellectual about that title and cool at the same time. Uh, around that time, Tony, together with the band's manager, turned their rehearsal room into a demo studio and that became the go-to studio for all the local indie bands in the area. During his role there as engineer, Tony recorded people like The Damned, Robin Trower, Nick Kershaw, Captain Sensible, uh, and then he, that led him to a position as the house engineer at Pete Townsend's famous Eel Pie studio in London. While working at Eel Pie, Tony had the opportunity to work with some of the biggest acts of the day, and he wound up engineering for groups like The Clash, Depeche Mode, Duran Duran, and the Sisters of Mercy, which ultimately allowed him to mix his first hit record, which was AHA's Take On Me, quickly followed by Naked Eyes, always something there to remind me. Great, great songs of that era, man. Eventually, he began working with legendary producer Trevor Horn on such high-profile projects as Seal, The Pet Shop Boys, and Frankie Goes to Hollywood. Were you involved with the Relax? No. Wish that I was, would. yeah, that was like, yeah. uh, that was back in the day we'd buy like a 45 or 78 or something. And it was like 12 versions, you know, 12 mixes. That was the thing. Trevor, Trevor liked to do that. He liked to squeeze every drop of creativity out of any track that he was involved in. And he was good at it too. Yeah. We, lots of versions of lots of, of projects that I worked with him on. Um, unfortunately, I didn't work on those great tracks, those initial Frankie tracks. I did some work on the follow-up album. It was called uh, Liverpool. Very cool, man. Good, uh, it, good. Didn't, it didn't grab everybody like uh, Relax and Two Tribes and uh, all that. That's kind. almost impossible to do. I mean, with rare exception. Like, yeah. That's more common, I think, no? Yeah, I'd agree. I'd agree. I mean, uh, a lot of... A lot of uh, I don't want to say this in a derogatory way, but a lot of the input from the artist when on a Trevor Horn production is kind of placed second fiddle to Trevor's production, you know? Sure. So not in every case, obviously, but the, there's a lot of artists he worked with where, whereby the production is so big and so attractive to your ear the the artist is kind of, you know, oh, who is this now? Who is this singing? It really doesn't oh, he's it. lost in the... Lost in the yeah traction, you know, and that's always a tough. That's the tough battle, you know. I hear it from artists. That's the tough thing, you know. I, I they don't let me do my thing, and other times I say, well, I go by what the producer says because I know I, it's a tough balance to walk. I don't know if there's any yeah, right. It really, is. it really is. But Trevor had his own way of making records, and and a lot of the artists were happy to let him have free reign and kind of, and, and I think that's true for Frankie. I mean, I wasn't there at the, uh, the onset of that session. Uh, but I think that's true to say that they had some fairly thin ideas for songs and it was Trevor that came in and fleshed them out and, uh, turned them into what uh, great records they became, you know, I've had some guys on really successful studio musicians from Nashville. And I remember asking one of them, a guy named Jerry McPherson, who you, you might even know him or know his name, but I said, what's the toughest thing about your job? And he said, song triage. And I said, what do you mean by that? You know, so like a triage nurse is the nurse when you go to the emergency room, she determines 
who gets taken care of first and helps with the recovery. It's like her point. So what he said by song triage, I said, what do you mean by that? He goes, well, when a song comes in and it's dead on the gurney, <laughs> and it's our job as session musicians to basically make chicken salad out of chicken shit. Yeah. You know, so, which is kind of like what you're talking about with Trevor. Did. True enough. Yeah. And, and that recipe, it doesn't guarantee success. Of course, you know, uh, nothing can be a great song with great production. Yeah. When the, when the song isn't so great, production can at least bring it halfway to, to uh, entertaining, you know? Yeah, for sure, man. Um, okay. So, uh, Frankie was talking Word was spreading fast after that, and Tony was then invited to L.A. to work on Joni Mitchell's Night Ride Home album, and that led to a partnership with Joni's then-producer, Larry, Larry Klein, and they got a Grammy nomination for Best Engineered Album for David Bearwall's Bedtime Stories. That's from David and David, of course, from the people. Correct. You know. Another partnership that kept Tony here in the States was with three-time Grammy-winning writer-producer Jim Steinman, who was mixing Celine Dion's platinum-selling and Grammy-winning album, Falling Into You. After continued success in the world of mixing, he received a call from acclaimed movie director, Boz Luhrmann, and he was asked to remix a track from the Moulin Rouge soundtrack album performed by Nicole Kidman. That remix became a number one hit in the UK, which then opened a door into movies and TV, which he's continued to work on. He's also continued to mix for artists such as The Pretenders, the B-52s, and Robbie Williams. He then saw success from writing music for TV shows such as Extreme Makeover Home Edition, which was on a long time. Deal or No Deal, Undercover Boss. That's a really emotional show. That's really cool. You know, that's always, there's some pretty tender stories there, man. Uh, yeah. It's, uh, you know, it's a challenge sometimes to, you know, capture what you're seeing on screen. Yeah, that's, so you have to watch that and then write, the underscore to that on a show like that yeah mostly what i do and the people i work with doug bossy being uh, uh the principal uh, partner in crime with the tv music stuff with um, i spy music check them out indeed. well that's that's doug's company and he kind of steers the ship there and i write with him for these shows we get primarily our music is really just wallpaper and it's there to fill in the holes between the bland dialogue in most cases, you know. I mean, it's, it's hard enough, uh, at least from my perspective, to watch those, well, those kinds of shows. If you take the music out, it's even worse, you know. Yeah. Our function is to provide music that fills the gaps, you know. You don't listen to the music, it's not meant to be listened to. It's just there as a kind of backdrop, you know. But on shows like Undercover Boss and Extreme Makeover, you can really make the music portray the, the, the right emotion for whatever is required. And it's quite tricky. After you do a few hundred shows, you know, you start to get the hang of it. And I'm certainly no John Williams, but, but you do tend to find some tricks that tend to work in those moments, you know, tear jerky moments that need a certain kind of usually piano cue or something of that nature. But it's, it's interesting stuff. Uh, but primarily, it's really just the run-of-the-mill reality TV shows that we do, you know. Yeah, but it's interesting when you said it's, we're the wallpaper. The thing is, that's how you know you're doing your job because you're wallpaper. If you're suddenly not wallpaper, then it's like, um, yeah. Suddenly your cue sticks out like a sore thumb because it has an incredible guitar solo on it. <laughs> not what they want, you know. Yeah. It needs to be um, transparent. And, and that's tricky, too, in its own little way. Well, it's different. You have to have a whole different thought process of writing right. where you're not writing to entertain. You're writing to... Absolutely. To be wallpaper. To, to fill a hole in, in, in the dialogue. And, uh, and, but you can't do anything that is in the least bit distracting. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. It is interesting for the most part. <laughs> Man, first of all, congratulations on such a great career. Um, I was wondering initially, so you're, you're signed with Horizontal Brian. You're, you know, you have a contract with A&M, which is a big deal back in the day. Very big deal. Yeah, and well. yeah, and suddenly you had to put down your guitar. And I was wondering, was that a natural process or was there some remorse having to do that? Or how did, how did that work for you? Uh, yeah, there was intense remorse, but not from putting the guitar down. 
I want to talk to you about the Bose S1, which is an amazing speaker for acoustic guitar gigs that I recently got to test drive. The S1 has two separate channels. It's got one for guitar and one for microphone. And there's a third channel you can use for a looper or for backing tracks that you can access by Bluetooth or through a 1 8 inch input. And the S1 is actually portable and rechargeable for up to 11 hours. So the guitar and mic channels, they have separate independent tone, volume, and reverb controls. And they also have something Something called a proprietary tone match switch which EQs optimizes and restores the natural sound of your acoustic guitar which as you know is typically your biggest problem when you're playing acoustic amps I tested the s1 speaker and it's very responsive to pickups and the tone volume and reverb controls genuinely work great you can position the S1 four different ways. You can tilt it back to broadcast out to an audience, or you can put it horizontally, vertically, or on a stand. The S1 also has a proprietary Bose accelerometer, which automatically adjusts the EQ and optimizes the sound based on whichever one of these four positions you're using. So effectively, you have an acoustic guitar amp, a PA, and a killer Bluetooth speaker all in one. So the bottom line is, if you're an acoustic player, there's absolutely nothing out there that sounds this good and this big, that's portable and battery powered. And the S1 also happens to be the best Bluetooth speaker Bose makes, which says a lot. I used it myself for a party we had here one night, and it was absolutely amazing. All my kids were freaking out. It's like having a full stereo system out on your patio. You can easily use this for DJing, tailgating, or whatever you want. Before this, you'd have to spend thousands of dollars on a bunch of equipment to get the same thing the S1 does. On top of that, it's sleek and it looks great, just like all Bose devices do. And besides whatever money back guarantee you get from wherever you buy the S1, Bose also warranties the S1 for two years from any kind of defects in materials or performance. For more information and to find out where to get your own S1, I'd like you to go to pro.bose.com forward slash podcast. Check it out at pro dot bose dot com forward slash podcast and get the s1 it's outstanding this is an important announcement for anyone who wants to advertise here on everyone loves guitar over the last nine months alone we've had 425,000 more downloads added over 25,000 monthly listens and grown our youtube subscriber base by 72 times during this time we've kept our advertising rates consistent but we will be increasing rates on January 1st. So if you're a business looking to generate new leads or increase your cash flow by picking up new clients or customers, or if you're a label looking to promote new music, then listen up. For information on advertising on Everyone Loves Guitar, fill in the short form at everyonelovesguitar.com forward slash advertise. Again, that's everyonelovesguitar.com forward slash advertise. Even if you want to advertise next year, you'll get to lock into marketing your product or service at the current rates before rates go up at the end of this year. If you want to buy or sell a home or investment property and you're here in the Tampa Bay area in Hillsborough, Pinellas, or Pasco counties, then listen up. West Florida Real Estate is a local residential real estate broker that's helped over 250 Bay Area homeowners buy and sell their properties in the last four years alone. If you're looking to sell, you'll want to get their free report, The 7 Biggest Mistakes Homeowners Make When Hiring a Realtor. And if you're looking to buy a property, you definitely want to get your hands on The 21 Most Expensive Mistakes Tampa Home Buyers Make When Buying a Home. Each one of these reports is going to save you time and money. Inside, you'll discover the 7 most important things to consider when hiring a realtor, what to do if you're buying and selling a home at the same time, and the danger of choosing a realtor who agrees with everything you say. To get your hands on these free reports, head on over to WestFloridaRealEstate.com. That's WestFloridaRealEstate.com. Hey, this is Craig. If you like this show and you want to support it and you want to keep it free, head on over to EveryoneLovesGuitar.com forward slash support. That's EveryoneLovesGuitar.com forward slash support. From leaving the band, from leaving those people, because they were my family really uh, at that time before I had my own. Uh, those guys were great. They're all a little bit older than I was. They were already a band when I joined them as a bass player. Um, I lied to them and said I was a bass player. I really wasn't, but I kind of bluffed my way in and kept. Got kept, a nice bass on your wall there. Uh, it's like a Paul McCartney bass. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. that is. That's a, a 62 violin bass. That's like, <laughs> only the right-handed version. Very cool. I'm sorry, Tony, go ahead. 
yeah yeah and uh so yeah bluffed my way into the band as a bass player but um those guys were five or six years ahead of me and uh, age-wise and in uh what they'd experienced playing in bands and they'd all been in bands that supported the who and any big band that came in town and they were at the the, the sharp end of the whole 60s music revolution you know they lived it and i was a few years a little bit too behind you know so i enjoyed it vicariously those guys listening to the stories on the way to a gig you know driving in the van for 100 miles up north and, you know north England, and, and uh it was it was an education you know not just musical but uh personal as well those guys yeah. older wiser intelligent guys and great friends and so it was a, a real wrench to make the decision to leave that behind and take a, a different path you know I, I always knew i wanted to do something in music it was all i was good at and all i was excited by um but there was a time after a and m refused to pick up our second album option i thought well yeah and now if ever there was a a, a pivotal moment then this is it, you know? So I had to tell the guys. And by that time, I was the principal songwriter and the lead vocalist. I graduated from being a ba bass player to being a songwriter. Which is a pretty significant accomplishment. Uh, yeah. Um, Especially being a junior man I think, on the totem pole. Well, our standards were helpfully low, so. Uh, <laughs> you're so <laughs> British, man. Some of the things you say, you're like so British on them. <laughs> Actually, I remember what it was. Our, our vocalist <laughs> had just left and it was back to the four of us again. And we went down the pub and looked at each other and went, well, what do we do now? Do we split up or what, you know, do we audition singers again? What do we do? And it was all uh, grim, a grim conversation. And I said, well, I'm no singer, but I'll give it a shot if I write the songs and then I can write the songs to the limitations of my weedy vocals, you know? <laughs> and, uh, that's, that's really ballsy. Good for you, man we got no other better suggestion, you know, all right, let's do that. So I started writing the songs and they were kind of cartoony songs. They weren't, they certainly weren't bridge over trouble water, you know, it was, it, but that wasn't the genre you were in. That wasn't the genre that band no. was, that was, that was that era of, you know, eighties sort of, you know, it definitely was. So we were kind of, I suppose if we were akin to any band of the time, it was madness. I don't know if you, you remember yeah, that. Yeah. 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 But all, you know, even like Duran Duran, Frankie, there was all that sort of genre. Back, it was, you know. I forget what you guys here called it. It was like the second British in, British invasion. Something it was like. alternative. You called it alternative rock back in the day. Just alternative, at least in New York City where I grew up. That's what they called it, you know. Well, we, we were in that pool. Yeah. And Madness were our kind of role models, I suppose, musically. Uh, it was, uh, you know, white man scar music, you know. Yeah, yeah. Scar, but pretend plastic scar. But we were in that kind of bag. And... Um, and so, uh, uh, where was I? I can't uh, you told them that you'll write the music. As long, uh, you'll sing as long as you could write the songs. Those kind of songs I felt comfortable writing. So we, we built up, uh, uh, you know, enough, enough songs to go out and gig them, you know. And, uh, and so it was, that made it doubly hard when it came to the point of deciding that's not for me and I want to go and be a sound engineer. Uh, because I'd miss, I knew I'd miss those guys. Yeah. Uh, not so much. Leaving the guitar wasn't difficult at all because I never really felt like I was good, a good musician. I knew I wasn't a good musician, but we had fun, you know, as a band, we had great fun. Um, and I think it's fair to say that, that all the guys felt the same about themselves. You know, we were good enough to be in a band. We managed to snag a record deal and that was a bonus. We were none Huge. of us that. Um, but you know, we weren't going to be, uh, up there with the Eric Clapton's, you know? Um, so leaving the guitar behind wasn't difficult. Uh, I, I was, I felt much more, uh, I had much more aptitude for sound than I did uh, producing it. <laughs> I had much more skill in recording it than playing it, you know? So a few questions about that. First of all, um, that was a pretty, I think to, to come to that conclusion, you know, you had to give it, some thought 
was that like, did you sit down with your parents or like somebody to give you, or you just thought it through yourself? No, I'd already got the job at Townsend studio by then. So that was kind of it really. I oh, thought, okay. Yeah. I did this great job. Yeah. One of my musical heroes. Sure. Um, of course I couldn't tell him that he's my boss, you know? Right. And, uh, but it was, it was, uh, it was still a wrench though. It was still hard to tell the band that this is, the, I'm going to take another path. I, I get that, man. And that, that's a very common thing for a very tough thing that a lot of musicians yeah. struggle with, man. Yeah. But it was a good problem to have, I suppose, you know? Oh yeah. It's a great problem to have. And you, you, you obviously were in the right place because look at all the success you had and the people you worked with. So I'm yeah, not... well, mainly I was in a great studio that had great clients. It wasn't just Pete's studio. He owned it, but it was a commercial studio too. So we had a lot of great people come in and use it that I, at first, you know, I was the tea boy and the sandwich getter. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and so at first my job was to sit at the back, shut up and watch, you know, and if anybody needed anything, I would go and get it. Yes. Yeah. Start. And I'm sure you, if people are getting jobs in studios now, they'll, they'll start. That. Same exact thing. And, uh, but you have to learn not to voice your opinion because nobody's interested, you know? Yeah. Uh, and you learn, you learn from other people's mistakes and other people's successes, you know, and you make notes and it was a great schooling, great schooling being in that studio. I would imagine a lot of clients walked in that door because of the success Pete had as a musician. No. Yeah, that's a fact. That was the first place I met Trevor Horn. Ah, okay. I'm his engineer through that encounter. That was later on through another set of circumstances. But he booked the studio one day, and you know I was in awe of him because of the great work he'd done up to that point. And he was a, a Who fan, as most people were that came into the studio. Kind of hard not to be, yeah. The great Trevor Horn waltzed into the studio on day one you know and he was who he was you know and 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 deserved all the uh accolades he got um but he's he was at the time he was very in control and you spoke when you're spoken to with trevor and and he's highly revered right so he's the great trevor horn in the studio and then pete stuck his head in the door to say hello to the client you know and Trevor turned into this little Who fan, you know, That's and funny. he was stammering and, and he was telling Pete how, how uh, I used to be in a band and, and we supported the Who in Newcastle City Hall. And, and he turned into what That's I was. It's funny. To Pete, you know, this Who fan. So it's quite funny to see that. But you're right. Just about everybody that came through the doors were, when Pete walked in, uh, you know, they, they would turn into... Uh, fawning who fans it's funny man i you know i'm not a guy that gets starstruck but i got i had a there's a band in sweden called the quill one of my favorite bands their guitar player christian carlson great player and he had another project going and he came back on the show and i wanted to help support it promote it and um he was so kind he sent me a i get a box one day and it has like uh two records, two t-shirts and picks. And I swear, man, I was like a little boy opening that thing. <laughs> you know, it was, so I understand that, man. It's really, it's, it's a funny thing like that, you know, yeah. really weird. Um, we um, immediately go back to, you know, being that kid who went downtown and bought the record and, uh, and now you're face to face with a guy, you know? Yeah. It does something to you. <laughs> it's, I'm not proud, but it does something to you. And it's, uh, it, yeah, it's it's kind of semi embarrassing the way you find yourself behaving in that situation. But, but I think everybody's not, yeah, they're cool with it. I think they get it. Like I'm sure you know when the first time Pete met Gilmore, maybe or some you know he might have had or Muddy Waters or whoever you know. Yeah, exactly. They've all got their heroes, you know. Yeah, all heroes, and you know we all turn to jelly in uh, in the right situation. You know? Yeah, for sure. Um, did you just like? take the how did you learn the craft of mixing hmm. was it just observational or did you just spend not, nights in the studio working and tinkering or yeah, it's just doing it really there's no secret i think that's true for anyone uh you know that becomes uh, proficient in any uh, particular skill uh, musical or otherwise it's just you just keep doing it and if you have the passion for it 
the passion gets you through the miserable bits, you know, where mm. you're just not getting it. Why, why is this so difficult? You know, your love of what it is and, uh, gets you through those sticky moments. But what started it was, what got the ball rolling was um, the manager of Horizontal Brian, my band, um, had a barn next to his studio in which we used to rehearse. Uh, he knew I had an interest in recording, even though it wasn't borne out in any practical way. I didn't have any equipment or anything. I was always fascinated by the way records sound, and I would always talk about it. And so he was aware of my interest. Uh, he had a shared interest in the whole business, and he suggested to me uh, that if I gave up my day job, would I come and work with him if he bought some rudimentary recording equipment and we would use the band as guinea pigs, you know, uh, to try and learn how this stuff works. And then hopefully we'd become a local studio that with which we could make a business out of. Yeah. So it sounded like a good idea. So I went from my 60 pounds a week driving, delivery driving, driving job um, to a 20 pounds a week <laughs> training, <laughs> recording engineer, not being trained by any one person in particular, because the manager was a guy called Dave Hoser. He didn't know any more than I did. So we just, he bought the equipment and we kind of unwrapped it and went, well, now what do we do? You know, it's, okay, there's a microphone that goes there. And we really just stumbled our way through. But surprisingly- That's really cool though, man. I mean, that you had that- um, I mean, there's no pressure. I mean, I'm sure you're motivated enough where you created your own pressure and sort of time frame, but that's really free. It was brilliant. It was the best thing. I've got Dave to thank for my career, you know. Probably Are you still would. in touch with him? Um, via email, very rarely. Um, sadly, no, really. Not as much as I should be. Um, it's hard for me to get back to England. Work doesn't allow those trips back as much as I would like. But um, I need to see the guy because I, I owe him big, you know. Yeah, well, uh, so, yeah, that's pretty cool, I think. Yeah, um, and so we we just kind of stumbled through, and uh, but we surprising surprisingly enough to both of us, within a year, maybe a little longer, we had a commercial studio. I mean, it was still just a barn with you know bits of wood nailed up to hold this and that and hessian on the walls. It was all makeshift, but it was the only studio in town. So all the other local bands kind of flocked to us, really. It was the only choice they had. And in those days, people didn't have any option of recording at home like they do now. Sure, sure. They had to go to somewhere that at least had a multi-track tape recorder and a couple of mics, you know. So that was us. And we did pretty well. And we gra graduated from doing the local stuff to putting adverts in the national music newspaper called uh, Melody Maker. Yeah. We advertised in there and we got some... Uh, uh, artists from further afield and it did all right until you know uh we got struck by lightning <laughs> oh literally well it was, uh, the the barn started <laughs> yeah we had this huge copper rod outside uh that was you know deep into the ground to help the earth uh, the grounding uh because we were getting okay. like, right on the countryside so the grounding wasn't that great and we used to get a lot of amp buzz so we stuck this copper pipe in the ground and wired everything to it. And, uh, and it reduced the buzz considerably. But of course, it was a lightning rod and we got struck by lightning. The whole oh, crap. Yeah. And uh, it dissipated anyway after a certain point. So I knew by then that I was in love with the job and, you know, hitchhiked to London uh, on the back of that and uh, used that as an opportunity to knock on every studio door I could find got a job have you got a job have you got a job and uh met with you know slammed door after slammed door and then finally ended up the last one of the day got any jobs by then uh, you know the enthusiasm had gone have you got any jobs yeah and this one last studio it's called denmark street studios um which is a famous street where all the guitar shops used to be yep. yeah yeah street is in a basement it's a pretty dingy studio but at least they answered with a with a yes you know yeah we got a session tomorrow can you do it <laughs> and uh it was considerably up a few runs from the demo studio we had yeah back home but i blundered my way through made a ton of mistakes and everything but got through it and you know took off from there 
That's, man, what a great story. Yeah. How did, yes. were you living at home then or were you, uh, uh, when you left your 60 pound job and started working in the barn, yes. were you living at home? Uh, well, I had my, uh, I was, uh, I wasn't living with my parents at that time, but close oh. to. it was a very small town. It's a place called uh, Ipswich in Suffolk on the, uh, I, I've heard of, I don't know why I know Ipswich, but there's, there's a famous football team. from Ipswich. Okay. Plus, um, uh, the, the, <laughs> the only two, uh, names, musical names ever to come out of Suffolk, which is the county that it was in, uh, are, uh, Nick Kershaw. Mm -hmm. Kershaw had a few hits around the world and uh Ed Sheeran he's from Suffolk too oh interesting but between those two nothing <laughs> yeah and that's pretty it's far much. apart pretty far apart okay so so that was tough for you then I mean if you're living on your own it was the big hit initially you took went down to uh, the 60 to 20 dollar that was a bit tough but it didn't matter you know it was so exciting to learn something that was rewarding as opposed to driving a delivery van around all day with no prospects of ever getting into anything better. Um, my dad uh, was a truck driver. So, you know, I was kind of heading that way. Sure. Uh, not that that would have been the end of the world. He had a good job. He was, a, you know, it was a, it was a good truck driving job. He drove all over the world, you know, and a lot the of passion stuff. wasn't there. Absolutely. I, you know, it when makes a huge difference. It, it never leaves you for the rest of your life. And, and if I could make that a career, then that, that was a huge uh, attraction. You know? Very cool, man. Once I got given that opportunity, I didn't want to let go. Hey, I'm going to talk about some of the artists you've worked with. And if you could um, discuss how you got the gig and if there's any cool or interesting story about working with them. And also, if there was something that made them unique or special uh, from your perspective i'd like to to know that uh start with joni mitchell oh uh, <laughs> well i mean uh joni's a uh i mean she's a special human being if you took the music away from her she'd still be a pretty special person just being in her presence and not in an overbearing way at all, quite the opposite she's so comfortable to be a, a, it, she makes you feel so comfortable to be around her. Um, but she, she speaks like, and, and I found this uh, to be a common trait in people that have become great writers, uh, the Townsends and the Joni Mitchells and the like. Um, they have this way of sounding like they're reading from their own book. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's just, you wanna write down what they're saying all the time. Joni's very much like that. She's so quotable. And she's so, such a great observer of things. And, um, and she'll give you her perspective on something that may be completely opposite to yours, but she, she verbalizes it so well that you kind of go, oh, well, maybe I was wrong about that. You know, she, she's amazing to be with and incredible to work with as well. Uh, one of the highlights was a, a, a quick moment. I mean, the moment itself wasn't out of the ordinary. It was just one of those moments in your life where you go, I've got to take a mental snapshot of this particular moment right now. And one of those was when I was with Joni, uh, we were working in a home studio. That's when we, we, we made all her records. Um, and it really wasn't a studio. It was a, a, an ex bedroom with a board in it. You know, that was about it. And a couple of tape machines. Um, and when she does the vocal, so there's no vocal booth. So when she does her vocal, she sits next to you at the board and you're all wearing headphones, you know. That's wild. There's Joni next to me and she smokes like a chimney, or she did then. Oh, wow. Uh, and <laughs> so it's smoke. Oh. It's quite an unpleasant, you know, yeah. experience in that regard from a health perspective. But she's smoking away and the cigarette butts are piling up as the vocal goes through, you know. And, uh, and she's sitting right next to me. And, and she's got her headphones on. I've got my headphones on. But her voice, I'm hearing through the headphones, obviously. And she's doing a vocal. And it's just amazing. And, and I was sitting there with shivers up my spine. You know, it was just a fantastic moment. And of course, we did all her vocals that way. And there was numerous tracks I worked with her on. But that first one, what a moment that was. So, yeah. How did you get connected with her? They, found, they, they brought you to LA specifically. Yeah, well, I sp I'd love to be able to say, well, she heard my work and she thought it was. <laughs> get that guy on the phone right now. 
guy, you know. Yeah. Fortunately, it was a little less romantic. Uh, my manager at the time, I was back in England, and my manager was the wife of an engineer, su superb engineer, not Sue, his name is Sue. Your manager was the wife of another engineer. Yes, his okay. name uh, Mike Shipley. Okay. Great engineer, great producer. And at the time he was working on a Def Leppard record, I believe, I mean, he's got a ton of credits to his name. He's done some fantastic work. And he was Joni's engineer prior to me coming over. But he was stuck on some, I think it was a Cars gig maybe, or a Def Leppard gig that was going on and on and on and couldn't get back to commit to Joni's record. So he's imagine wife. that. I mean, I'm you, but imagine that the difference where the the labels are like, hey, no, man, we need to sink more money into this. We need more time compared to how it is today. It's now, just like it. Imagine that. Yeah, you know, I, they used to pay for your food in the studio. Yeah, mind, <laughs> it, no, it's, you know. mind blowing. In yeah. fact, I, I had Phil Collin on the show from Def Leppard, and he one of the things he talked about is, uh, and I don't know what brought this up. We were talking, and he said. They un or maybe it was in his book, and I talked to him about it. Uh, it. He was they were getting conscious of all these bills running up in the studio when they when they started to realize, hey, this isn't free money. We got to pay this shit back. And they did like an audit, and it was like twenty thousand dollars on coffee or shit, you know, uh, stuff like that. And, and they, they put it fashion, you know. Uh, yeah, it, it, I. <sighs> You could almost see in the artists, really, that they liked that aspect to a degree. They liked the, you know, bring more food aspect of, you know, the Roman Empire thing, or oh, I don't know. What. <laughs> uh, but it, was, it played into some fantasy, you know, we're in this big studio and we can get what we want. Let's rent one of those things, you know. Then you could kind of see the indulgence and, and them enjoying it. But then on the second album, it would be completely different because then by then they would have got the, the bill for the indulgence on the, of the first album. <laughs> yeah. Different attitude. Interesting. But, uh, but it was a common occurrence. But um, so, Sorry, so you, you were saying that... Uh, so Mike... Yeah, Mike. With Joni and uh, so his wife, Lynn, my manager, said, I've got an engineer who would love to come out and work with Joni. And fortunately... Uh, her husband and producer at the time uh, was Larry Klein and he and I uh, got off got on really well and we got off to a flying start and uh, and continued when Joni's record was over uh, I did another three or four records with him afterwards and and on uh, you know through the years yeah. he was a guy to work with and very inspirational and a brilliant bass player too so let me ask this, were, were you married at that time when you came over here? No. Okay, so you were single, so it was pretty easy. I met my wife, she just, I didn't know she was gonna become my wife. Oh, interesting. She didn't know she was gonna. <laughs> she, neither of you knew that she had neither. So did she come out with you or? Actually, no, we'd connect, in fact, my, my wife is a, a, a singer. Oh, cool. I got given her band to produce, this is back in England. This is just before I came out to do Joni's record. And so we met during the course of working on her record and then stayed in touch while I was out here doing Joni's record. And, and then stay, I, I thought I would be going back to England once Joni's record was through, but Larry and I hooked up and then that one gig turned into another gig. And I ended up with a, you know, a phone number and a social security card. So uh, you know, by then I was living here without any great intention, it just happened that way. And my wife and I are uh, kept in touch. And so she came out for a couple of visits. And then on the third visit, she never went back. And we got married. That's cool. And that was how, how many years ago? Loads. <laughs> <laughs> 21. That's nice, man. Congratulations. So were you excited about coming here? Or because it's a big move, man. It's fucking huge. No, I didn't know I was going to move here, though. I thought it was one off gig. And, you know, of course, uh, as everybody does, you, you, you have some self doubt there. And I'm thinking, Joni Mitchell, what? And I knew I'd only got the gig because of my manager's relationship with Mike, you know. So I'm thinking, oh, I'm going to get out there and they're going to find out that I'm just a beginner, you know, and I'm going to get kicked back and I'll be, you know back on that plane on day two. Right. But 
you know, to my surprise, it, it continued. Um, so it was never a conscious move to, to come out here. No, but once you decided to stay, was it like, uh, it was, was that a difficult decision? No, because it was like uh, a utopia. What, doing this job out yeah, here. Yeah, okay. The, the marriage between the way the city is and doing this kind of job or any job in the entertainment industry, I, I'm guessing. Yeah. Thing. It's just so geared up to do this kind of work. Back in England, at the time, I'm sure it's different now. Uh, you know, we're talking about 25 years on now or whatever. Mm. Um, and I'm sure London has kind of pulled its socks up a bit. But, but at the time, it was really difficult to get food or drink after nine o'clock in the evening in London. This is London, even. Really? Um, pubs would shut. Um, everything was shut. So you come to the studio at midnight, and the only choice of food you had was the burger stall at the end of the road, you know? Wow. And not just that, but, you know, trying to get your laundry done is like, well, we only open on Thursday afternoon. You know what I mean? A slight exaggeration, but you know what I'm saying. Yeah, but it's not convenient. I get it. Yeah. It was a challenge, especially when you have a job that takes up so many hours in the day. It was difficult to keep, you know, all the domestic plates spinning. Sure. So when I came out here, and I remember the moment, um, they put me in a hotel in Hollywood, but Joni's studio it was in her house in Bel Air. So they gave me a rental car, and it was this little Volkswagen convertible thing. And I, I <laughs> Which you must have loved. We don't have convertibles in England. We're <laughs> it's <laughs> fucking freezing there. Yeah. Well, I'm roofed down, yeah. <laughs> and I'm driving down Sunset, you know, on the way to Bel Air, and I'm thinking. Yes. Was it hard driving? All right. No, because, you know, in England, um, we drive on the other side of the road, but the rest of Europe doesn't. Okay, so you had so driven... France or Germany, which, you know, uh, my band used to play in, Ger in Germany in particular a lot, and we'd all take turns in driving the, the van. So you, you get used to swapping over. As soon Dude, because as I drove over in England, and I, <laughs> I was like, I gave the wheel of my wife not long after. I'm like, this is going to be dead, the it's death trap. Um, uh, especially for Americans, because they, uh, they generally... Roundabouts. Uh, roundabouts. <laughs> From, uh, from other parts of Europe are familiar with that concept, but Americans tend to struggle. Yeah. Things where you have to turn the steering wheel, you know, you guys tend to go either straight or left or right. In well, and you don't know who goes, is it your turn? Do you wait? Do you wave? I mean, like it's, and it's paranoia because everybody's zipping around you. That's what was my dilemma. I was like, holy you shit. Know, you know, the, the rules are, uh, if you follow the rules, it's not so bad. The worst one is the Arc de Triomphe in Paris. I took oh, my car to yeah. Paris. I had a gig in Paris once and I took my car thinking it would be fun. And uh, I, was, I was waiting at that thing, trying to wait, wait for a gap in traffic for like two and a half days, you know. <laughs> and then at the point you just get fed up with waiting, uh, with waiting and you just shut your eyes and you go, all right. I'm go. Wow. Live out into the chaos, you know, and hope you survive. That is, that's a handful, that is. Yeah, man. And uh, okay, so, by yeah. the, so you're driving in the convertible. Yeah, and just the experience of that, that, those few miles, I kind of, you know, it was a kind of a, a, an awakening. It's like, this is good. This is a good place. And then after the studio session would finished, uh, and I discovered a place in the valley called uh, the Casa Vega. And it became a kind of a hotbed of uh, studio workers and the like, you know, that it would stay open until 2 a.m., serve food, drink. It was great. So you That's finished. Cool one o'clock in the morning you go to the Casa Vega and there'd be other industry people there and it was a great thing and it, That's it cool. was the only place you know just the city in general is more geared up in that way I'm surprised I thought London would have been more progressive that's really weird not, though, not in those days it was a chore yeah I would expect Dunstable when my wife grew up to be to pull up the streets at eight o'clock but not London man Probably that's would. odd uh David Gilmore what did you he's like my all-time well, um, that was, uh, I didn't really work with Dave Gilmore per se. This is the problem with biography, with biographies that are written by other people. <laughs> you check them, but you're not really checking them. And there's a few kind of hiccups in there. I'll have to clarify. Um, oh yeah, that's fine. But I worked with Gilmore, uh, because I was working with Pete uh, Townsend mm -hmm. on an album of his called White City. Mm -hmm. And, um, 
And he'd invited Gilmore over to play on a track. Oh, wow. And he, so that was fun for me being, you know, a fan of each of theirs. Um, Gilmore turned up and uh, Pete played him the part that he wanted him to play. And so Dave went out into the, the studio and uh, Pete was communicating through the talkback system. And he was, uh, and Dave was kind of emulating what Pete had shown him. And, and Pete said, no, no, you're a note short. You're missing a note there. Dave goes, no, I don't think so. It was fine. And he goes, no, you're definitely missing a note. Put the, uh, you know, add, add the F sharp after the second beat. So, so Dave's trying to do this. And he goes, yeah, I need an extra finger. I can't play this. It's, it's too difficult. So Pete said to me, Tony, get in the studio and be Dave's extra finger. So Holy <laughs> shit. Not too intimidating. Oh, um, um, this is on film somewhere because Pete used to film everything in those days. Is that on YouTube by any chance? No, no, I, I don't I, think Pete would put that on YouTube. Yeah, I don't think so either. And it's probably in the uh, extensive archives of Eel Pie Studios. You know, we, there's <sighs> rooms and rooms of tapes and videos and stuff. But um, uh, so I went out into the studio and sat behind Gilmore's guitar neck and at the key moment in the piece he was playing, I would add my finger <laughs> and, uh, and we got through the part. So that was quite an odd experience. Yeah, but, that is odd. But it was kind of, uh, it was fun. And, uh, you know, it was all done with good humor. It certainly wasn't, you know, uh, it's oh, like, yeah. it wasn't working. You know, it was, it was kind of a fun experience. Was he playing the Red Strat at that time? No, he was playing the Black Strat. The Black Strat still. So... <laughs> It was the black strat yeah yeah it was. the black strat the yes. one that just got auctioned off for like millions yeah exactly uh i'm not and, looking for and there is actually i'm thinking now uh, there is a film that accompanies pete's white city album and and there's segments in it where the band perform each song i wonder what is that on youtube anywhere or he's on that and he's playing that part he must be miming it because he's playing it without my crucial <laughs> <laughs> credit given did you get a did you get a player credit on that no um, <laughs> bastard got, when you're a house engineer you don't have a manager so you don't get credit for anything i didn't get credit for some of the mixes i did when i was in, in house engineer that's how uh, it, because you're a house you're uh, yeah I don't have anyone to fight for my corner, you know? Wow. I'm going to just write that down because I want to look around for that uh, White City. Yeah, White um, City. That must be on YouTube. Making of. But it's the one song that David Gilmour plays on, on the whole album. So that would be the one. Um, and I'm asking you this, not looking for gossip, just looking for like um, thoughts or got personality wise what is Gilmore like because he he just seems to be a very reserved that's exactly how he is and you know I didn't learn any more about his personality that day it was just the one day yeah learned on watching uh film or video of him since you know interviews or stuff like that how he is in his interviews is how he is or how he was that day anyway. yeah pretty... I don't know how a true a reflection of his personality is but there's a great documentary on YouTube about the making of one of, uh, one of his solo albums, I think, or it might even be a Floyd album. Uh, there's two. Right, it's the lyrics, and there's a whole documentary about yeah. the making. And it's making of, uh, there's, there's the making of uh, Dark Side of the Moon, the making of Wish You Were Here, and it's the making of, um, the, the leading up to the concert in Poland, I think. Oh, okay. Yeah, at least that's the one I saw. And his wife was in there, and it's in his studio, and he's breaking, yeah, yeah it was a... You know, I've had family is sitting in the garden and they're having a barbecue and stuff. And was, you yeah. get a sense of his personality in that documentary. It was pretty well made, uh, but I didn't, I didn't really, I wasn't, uh, uh, we didn't leave uh, like best mates or anything. It was just a day in the studio, but it was a fun day. Oh my God. Cause I've had a uh, guy Pratt on the show. His, did you ever work with guy bass player? He's been Gilmore's bass player. And then, um, for Pink Floyd, one after not after Roger Waters, I think Tony Levin or somebody was there for a minute, and then Guy Pratt's been there since. And I had Steve DeStanislaw, who's David's um, drummer for a long time, on the show. And I I asked them both. I said, "Look, is there any chance David would ever be interested in doing this?" And Steve didn't know, but Guy's an English guy, so they've known each other for years. And he said, "No." 
<laughs> he said he's just not that guy. He does not he give interviews. Yeah, he, he and I get it. When spoken to kind of person, you know. Yeah. He, job though, and, and he was brilliant. I mean, that was just one aspect of the day's work with, you know, me and my finger. Yeah. But oh, no, he's played on other parts of, of the same song and and uh, was Dave Gilmore, of course, you know, and was brilliant. Another hero of mine, Robin Trower. What'd you do with Robin? Uh, well, that was at the demo studio, our, our band's studio. Um, yeah. With the lightning rod. Uh, that I don't really know how he came to use our studio. Uh, it was just demos that he wanted to do. Um, I think he, he must live in the area. I think that would be the only reason he would come to our studio because it really wasn't palatial in any way, you know, mm. being, of an artist of the stature of Robin Troa. Yeah. So a player, man. Just went, oh, there's a studio. Let's go and put some demos down. You know? It was yeah. a very casual thing for him. But it was a great session uh, from my perspective because it was the first real artist that I worked with. I don't mean any disrespect to the local bands. Oh, yeah. At that point, because uh, there were some great bands locally as well. But uh, he was the first artist of any repute, let's put it that way, that came to our studio. studio. And he was very fastidious in how he wanted it to sound. So it may have been demos, but he was, he was pushing it, you know, um, to get them as good as, uh, as we could get them. And he mm. pushed me harder than anybody else had done up to that point. And he would, and he had great players with, with him and who had great uh, sounding instruments and, and it was down to me to capture the greatness, you know? And the first playback, I remember he came in and he went, oh, okay, okay. Now let's try and get the drums a little this and a little more of that. And, and, uh, and it took a lot of work to get him happy, to make him happy. But he would do things like we would, I would act on his requests and then he'd come back in and listen to the results of another take. And he'd say, yep, that's good. That sounds good. I'm happy with that. But what can we do to get it one degree better? I'm thinking, I don't know. This is the wow. best. Wow. And, and he did this one thing that I'll never forget. He got, now in those days, we used to do things that um, we used to put it on cassette you know, whether it's a mix so far, this particular session was a recording session. Ultimately, I had to mix it. But um, at this point, we were just doing the tracking and we would put stuff down to cassette and he would take the cassette out to the car and listen in the car, you know, familiar surroundings kind of thing. And then he'd come back in and then he'd say, well, the low end is doing a little, he was doing this in the car and it should be that. And so we'd tweak and we'd tweak. And um, he brought uh, what we used to call a ghetto blaster. Yeah, box, they call them here. Boom box, right. Yeah. Fairly insulting kind of term. <laughs> uh, but, uh, uh, he brought one of those in and put the cassette in there and we, and we listened to it. And he put the loudness button on, you know, those things you... Yeah, for boost the bass. And it would boost the bass and the top end and there'd be nothing in the middle. And it, to an engineer, it sounded horrendous because it's all the ugliness of the top end and the low end became this woofy noise, you know. Over a little tiny speaker, that, effectively, yeah. You know, for the, con the average consumer, it made it sound bigger. And, and, and he understood that, but he said, but listen to what the loudness button does to the snare drum. And it did, it made it sound huge, you know. And he said, I want our snare drum, uh, snare drum to sound like that. Wow. I, go, oh, no, I, don't, I don't know. I'm just a beginner. I don't know. But he would push and push and push until I got it. And so I learned a lot from that session and from that aspect of it, that things can always sound better. That's you know, really cool. Perfect. You know, listen to it from so, somebody else's ears and it can be better. And I still stick to that principle now, really. Uh, what determines whether it's finished or not, is usually things like budget and time. And, you know, I was going to ask you that. How do you, how are you with, but it's budget and time. Yeah. Others in a way it's kind of good because it takes the pressure sort of off of you in a sense. Yeah. Cause otherwise you could be working forever on something. You could in theory, you could keep mixing forever. And I, I kind of like that about it because I'm always learning new stuff, you know, and 
I always get the feeling that I'd like to go back to that album that I've just mixed and try this new thing I've just discovered. Yeah. All again, which is, you know, stupid really, but. No, but it's, it's your enthusiasm for what you do. It sounds great. Thing of wanting to get better, continue. Yeah. Better. And, and he's kind of set me on that path of how, what, what can we do to make it better? Personality wise, I'm assuming he's probably a lot close, like Gilmore, kind of a proper British gentleman, older British, well, now older British gentleman. A bit more forthright than Gilmore. Uh, <laughs> yes. It's, yeah. yeah. Still, right? What's that? It's still talking about Robin Trower. Robin Trower, yeah. Yeah, he, um, he's a bit more, uh, he just says what he thinks, you know. I liked him. He was a good guy to work with. And uh, what would you do with The Damned and Captain Sensible? Uh, well, that was later on. I think that's something else that got um, jumbled in the bio. Uh, oh. We're in the demo studio, the same studio. Yeah. Local stuff. Um, Captain Sensible answered one of our ads in the Melody Maker and said, I just want to put some songs down. Um, where are you guys? We went, we're in Suffolk. It's like 100 miles north. And uh, anyway, oh, well, you're all right then. Are there any hotels nearby? No, no hotels. <laughs> I'll sleep on the floor then. Yeah, you can sleep on the floor. So he spent a week on the floor of the studio. You're kidding. So Captain Sensible is a singer of the dance for people. Uh, no, no, he's a guitarist. Oh, I thought, I thought he was a, a songwriter. He's a songwriter, yeah. Yeah, sorry, songwriter and, and guitarist. And he wanted to put down some of his own material. Oh, so okay. He, up, he was there for a week, slept on the floor, and did some great That's stuff. hilarious. A good writer. And, uh, and it wasn't two years later, Ill Pie when the damned booked some time. So captain being the guitarist in the damned, you know, so we kind of uh, reacquainted. That's funny. Did, did you ever work with uh, the UK subs? No. Cause I have a, uh, one of their uh, Alvin Gibbs. I don't know if you know him. No, he's coming on the show soon. I'm sort of like in this, I'm getting in these, that niche now of like hardcore UK original gangster guys, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, the damned are great. Cause they turned up, uh, we did a song, oh, I'm trying to think. It was a hit, it was a hit, the song, and this is early in my Eel Pie days when I just graduated to House Engineer from Sandwich Collector. <laughs> Light bulb game. Yeah. He used to come in once, right? And he was one of those producers that, you know. Who, who uh, came in once? I can't really say his name, but oh, okay. he came in. And the first thing he said to me is, we had a conservatory on the end of the control room at Eel Pie, and it was beautiful because you could see out into the conservatory and then from the conservatory, you could see the River Thames because all people- Oh, that's nice, man. Studios are right on the river. Um, he's got a couple of houses and a couple of studios and they're all on the river. He has an affinity with the water. He likes to be by it, right? So- um, Hang on one second. Let me just tell a conservatory is basically like, because they don't have those here. Uh, oh, a, yeah. It's like a, a, an extension to the room, but that's all glass. Yeah. Glass, where you, glass it. Yeah. Thanks. What do you call it then? A patio room or something? Yeah, it's like a it's like a glass encased patio. Sort yeah, all right. of. One of those. He yeah. had yeah. on the side of the control room. The control room had a window into it, and so you could see right through the conservatory. Right out to the river. Right That's... down the river. It was beautiful. Lovely studio. And um so this producer came in and oh, so around the inner part of the frame of the conservatory, we had colored light light bulbs. That's so, cool. it, you know, it looked kind of pretty and colorful. Yeah. And he looked at, he came, first thing he said, no hello or anything. He came in and he looked at the light bulbs and he said, that yellow bulb is out of sequence. <laughs> the yellow bulb, you know, this goes into that. Van anal, a little anal. <laughs> story, you know, where they don't have the red. Wow. So I had to take the yellow bulb out of the chain and move it round so it was in sequence. And he said, no, I want the sequence to be blue, red, green, yellow, blue, red, green, yellow, all the way around. What a fuck nut, Every man. Got in bulb out. And, and this is gonna impact the performance of the band, how? I have no idea, but <laughs> what it did impact is the way I made his tea. Good for you, man. Everybody else, I put a fresh tea bag in his cup, but for him, I got an old one out of the trash and put it in his tea. Right on, man. It's well-deserved. Yeah. <laughs> God, what a nut. Well, Who has time to think of do shit like that? It's in the age of lots of drugs in the studio. It, it made people behave in a very, you know. 
yeah paranoid slash self-obsessed way you know there was a lot of that kind of thing hence the m m stories flying around yeah uh, getting ridiculously you know demanding on their riders <sighs> like that you know i think that what that's what fueled that kind of behavior at the time Mostly. yeah probably drugs and nice and like uh, extreme but narcissism. That was but, uh, uh, but um, what I was aiming at there was the damned, the, the damned came yeah. the, the, the studio and they turned up in all their finery. I don't know if you remember how they looked. They uh, had like costumes. Very goth um, uh, attire, you know, long black, uh, you know, um, Dracula-esque overcoats. And Dave Vanian, the vocalist, was in full regalia with his white d'artagnan fluffy shirt you know the, the puffy shirt of seinfeld you know the yeah. seinfeld puffy shirt i, I know that to d'artagnan i know what you're talking about yeah. and uh, and and his his long swept hat swept back black hair and white face makeup right so he, oh my god he was just off a movie set or something but the whole band were playing their parts you know and in, in the goth thing and uh, we had this little boat uh, that was for use for studio clients because we were right on the river. Pete bought uh, a police boat, you know, an ex police boat, and it was a little five person motor launch thing. And we learned how to, you know, drive this, thing, whatever you call it, drive, sail, this thing. And, uh, and so the band saw this police launch. Oh my God. At the studio and went, it was lunchtime. We said, well, let's go to the pub for lunch, which was just a little way up the river. And so they went, well, let's take the boat. <sighs> in the boat, right? And we, we go up the river until we get to the pub and we pull into the pub and there's all the old regulars sitting outside in the beer garden, you know, with their light owls and stuff. And, and then <laughs> the police launch pulls up outside the pub where you moor your boat. And there's Dave Vanian, at the, <laughs> this, uh, or whatever you call it, the sharp end of the boat, you know. And he's doing one of these, you know, with his flowy, his flowy shirt. And you almost imagine the sword, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The boat and into the pub, you know, pint of beer, please. And so it's quite a spectacle for the locals, you know, to see this. That's hilarious, man. You know. Must and it ended, ended well, though. No, no accident. Nobody fell off the boat or anything. No, nobody fell off the boat. But Surprisingly. It, yeah. What'd you do with Jeff Beck? Uh... I did an album. It was uh, Malcolm McLaren, who was the yeah, Sex Pistols. Sex Pistols manager, but became an artist in his own right with Duck Rock. Remember that thing? You must be familiar with that one. I'm not with Duck Rock. Duck Rock. It was uh, it was it was a great piece of work actually. It sampled lots of uh, burgeoning uh, hip hop radio. DJs, uh, and, and they'd come out with scratching, the art of scratching. Sure. And he'd sampled a lot of the radio conversations and the scratching samples and used them with a hip hop beat and put this silly white rap over the top. But it was a good record. Um, there was a particular hook in this song. I'm trying to think of what it was. Uh, I can't remember. I can't remember. But it was, it was, I'm sure you'd, you would recognize the sample. It had a very hooky sample in it. I wonder what. He had the foresight to, um, Duck Rock was the album, and I'm trying to think of what it was called. But it, it turned a lot of heads. It, it, was, uh, it was kind of very pioneering, the way he did it. And it was Malcolm McLaren was the artist. Yeah, it was the artist. Interesting. And, um, and it, it, it brought hip-hop to a white audience basically I mean, sure. stating it a little bit i'm sure there was more uh, more influential artists that did that job but, but and for his second album i got drafted in to be the engineer on, on and we were working with a producer that i'd teamed up with at that point his name was andy richards he was primarily the keyboard player on the frankie goes to hollywood stuff Trevor. oh yeah keyboard player and was responsible for all those big sounds and the whooshes and the swishes on those records. He was a kind of a sound palette guy, you know, hmm. good at the big sounds. And uh, he, uh, I did the Pet Shop Boys with him and then we took on 
Malcolm McLaren. Wanted to do his second album. And so we sat down, had a meeting with Malcolm, and he said, so guys, my idea for the second album is to combine hip hop grooves with Strauss waltzes. With what? No, Tchaikovsky waltzes. Okay. Uh, obviously it was a bit of both. A few Strauss licks and a few Tchaikovsky licks. He wanted to combine. Okay. And we said, but Malcolm, <laughs> waltzes are in three, four time and yeah. waltzes are in four, four time. And he said, doesn't matter. If we approach this perfectly, we can make it work. So we go, so we, Andy and I go off and we go, how the hell are we going to make this yeah, work? Four bars of a waltz to three bars of a hip hop. <laughs> it's kind of, um, <laughs> slow you know, one down, speed one up. You're good to go. Academic ways of making it work, you know, they fit square peg in a round hole. Thing. Yeah. Just, so we're, we're trying to chop up the waltzes and try and make them work to a four, four beat. And it just sounded fake. You know, it sounded like it was forced. And um, which, which it was. <laughs> we weren't f finding a solution, you know, clearly. And Malcolm was getting frustrated. And, and it was his idea to bring Jeff Beck in to in the pursuit of trying to find a thread through the 4 4 and the, and the 3 four, and the 3 4. Being that Jeff Beck was such a brilliant musician, he'll find a way. And he didn't really find a way. It was an <laughs> task. Uh, we, we did kind of stumble our way through it and, it and the album did come out, but that principal idea got diluted the further we went into it, you know, and it ended up being a couple of moments of those Strauss, Tchaikovsky things, and the rest of it were just kind of regular tracks. But Jeff Beck came in and he kind of injected new life into the project because, I mean, the guy, he was always been a hero of mine anyway. Yeah. Um, so it was a thrill to see him walk through the door. Um, but what astounded me was he turned up, he had his white strat in a canvas bag on his shoulder and he, he walked into the control room and he unzipped the bag. Um, uh, but the zip wouldn't, wouldn't open the whole way. So he had to shake his guitar to get it to come out of the bag. Right. So he's holding his guitar bag upside down and he's shaking it. And the, and the white strap falls out and goes bang on the floor, right? And we go into oh, Jeff, Jeff, you know, no, it's fine. And he picks the guitar up and he's playing and he's tuning and he goes, um, you got an amp? We can, well, yeah, I'm sure we can find an amp. You know, Jeff Beck arrives for a session with no amp. And somebody found, uh, we were in Trevor Horn's studio at the time. And somebody found a Fender Twin, bog standard, nothing special. And we put it out in the studio and Jeff goes out there and plugs in and he's, he's playing with his fingers and he couple of tweaks of the amp and it sounds amazing. But yeah. uh, fingers that are making it sound amazing. Yeah. And, uh, and he goes, he's tapping his pockets. He goes, uh, has anyone got a pick? So now, so now we're all looking around for a guitar pick for the great Jeff Beck. You know, he doesn't have a guitar, a guitar pick with him. He, he didn't, when does he, I never, almost never seen him play with a pick. No, I haven't either, but you know, that he was, he was uh, requesting a guitar pick and we yeah. just odd <laughs> that he would turn up for a session with no pick. And, um, and then he wanted to play in the control room. That was the first guitarist I'd ever seen. Uh, a lot of them do that now, but he wanted to be in the control room. So we fed the cable through the door and out. Yeah. And, um, and sh I shoved a, 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 an SM 57, a Shaw 57 on his guitar amp and nothing special, but the sound was amazing. It was incredible. Because it, it was Jeff back. And he played the most amazing stuff. I've never been so impressed with a single musician as that day with Jeff Beck. It uh, was mind blowing what he played. And somebody took a recording, and I wish I still had it. Um, we had these digital recorders in the studio at the time. It was actually a video Betamax recorder converted to an audio recorder, and it was called a Sony F1. And uh, we put a tape in and recorded the whole session, but we only had Jeff's guitar go into it. Hmm. I wish I could get that back. I don't know what happened to it. And that would have been incredible. What was he like, personality-wise? It was really pleasant to work with. Yeah, I've heard that he can be a bit of a thing, but um, yeah, that's the, I don't know any, anybody 
that's just what you re- I've read. I don't know anybody yeah, that's working. Well, I don't really know it from any reliable source. It's just rumor and impression that you go away with of, of people are uh, this way or that way. Yeah. But he was great with us. He put up with all the nonsense of what we were trying to get. Into. <laughs> Malcolm McLaren's ideas. Yeah. I, you know, I mean, Jeff, we want you to meld uh, classical three, four with hip hop. I'm like what? Yeah, but the, you know the way he t- Malcolm's good at the, the. He could probably sell the idea really well, right? And he's good yeah. at talking about it, definitely. Yeah. And he he speaks in very flowery terms, and and it's your job. You he makes you feel like well, it's your job to provide a solution here. You know, it's not he. he you can't. He doesn't want to have any. I'm the wizard, man. You need to come up with the how to. And that's how he is, and yeah. he. He's very forward thinking and he's got a great imagination and all those things. So he did have valuable input on this thing, but I, I'm not sure we found the best solution that we could have. You know, somebody else might have, might have done it a much better job. Uh, but Jeff Beck, it was just fun to have him around and watch him play. It was amazing. Um, what would you, I can talk to you for stories for hours and hours. What would you say, Tony, the top three experiences you've had musically? It doesn't have to be in the studio, whatever, you, whatever, you, you know, whatever that answer is. Uh, um, <laughs> Just go with your knee jerk reaction. Let's see. Well, that's got to be one. With Jeff. Yeah, I'm sure. Yeah, yeah. Listening to him play his guitar. What an experience. Um, uh, what did you say? Best ex- top, top three all right. uh, musical experiences you've had. Yeah. All right. So another one was, uh, I don't know if it, it's more of an engineering experience than watching someone perform. But when I was at Pete's studio and working with him, I didn't actually work with him that often. He was off doing his thing. And more often than not, it was a client. I'd be working with a client that was renting the studio from me. But occasionally, I'd work with Pete. I worked Pete, uh, with Pete on an album called Scoop mm-hmm. that was an album of his Who demos. And I worked on that the album White City and a couple of other bits and pieces. But there was one day when I was in the control room and Pete came in and he was waving the Tommy CD. Tommy had just been released on CD. And he said, look, you want to have a listen to this? I went, yeah, all right. So we played the CD over the main monitors in the control room and he looked at me halfway through and he said it sounds like shit doesn't it i said yeah it's terrible it's terrible and somebody whoever did that initial cd release of tommy didn't take the care that they should have they didn't find the original master they probably used some copy it was lousy there was dropouts there was it was noisy really noisy there it was fluttering it, it was a it was a mess so he said, right, that's it. He said, for Quadrophenia, when Quadrophenia gets re-released on CD, we're going to do it again. Do you want to do it with me? Oh, um, wow. Said, uh, yes, all right, trying to stay cool and, you know, in the employ of the great Pete Townsend. And I said, yes, Pete, yes, I would like to do that. <laughs> and he said to me, um, are you familiar with the album at all? <laughs> you know, I've only lived with it since I was 15 or whatever it was, you know. Yeah. And I know every single note on that record, but I had to reply in a, in a kind of, yes, yes, I, I'm familiar with that work, Pete, yeah. But then I got given the task of not only mixing it um, for CD, but to do that, uh, w- considering that the aim of that project was to get pristine quality wherever we could, you know. So that meant finding the original masters, which was a task uh, in itself because Pete started that record on his own eight track multi-track recorder in his house. Wow. Which was eight track onto one inch tape. And there's not many machines that will play that back uh, by then. You know, this is a few years on obviously. And so it was a challenge to not only find those original masters, but then to get a machine to play them and then transfer them over. Um, um, but I also had to get, the original band masters because what happened is pete started every track of quadrophenia on his own in his own studio at home Mm. he played to a click track and pete was always way ahead you know when it came to technical aspects of recording 
and he was using click tracks way before anybody else. I've never heard anybody so far back. You're the first time, this is literally the first time I've ever heard anybody with a click track back. This is, uh, Quadrophenia came out when in the Seven, early 80s or late 73, I think. It was that far back. Yeah. Wow. And he was, that's amazing, man. And um, so he, he was always, but he, you know, when you think about um, who's one, next, who's uh, next, Barbara yeah. O'Reilly with the yeah. sequels, so, you yeah. know, he was always kind of ahead of the game that way. Incredible. But, um, even drum machines as well. Yes. And, and quadra as good as tommy was i'm i actually like quadrophenia okay. better because it's so much more expansive there's so many more i mean there's more than just guitar bass you know there's he, he had a lot of strings in there it's it's such a robust writing, i think he grew up as a writer as well by then you know he, yeah his writing was uh, just amazing but uh so what uh, the process that uh, they went through to get that record recorded was Pete did the eight tracks at home and he would play piano at home and, and banjo. He's, he was uh, initially a banjo player before he was, a, <laughs> and uh, he's brilliant on, on everything. He's a brilliant pianist. He's brilliant. You know, who's playing banjo in England. I know. Like, why would you pick up a band? It's not like, you know, the country music's there. I think his dad was influenced him as far as the band. I might be wrong about that, but his dad was a musician and I think he was a banjo player and, and was a big influence in uh, Pete becoming a banjo player too. I, I could be a bit sketchy on the details there, but uh, it was something in his youth steered him towards banjo. And so once Pete had got the tracks in shape at home, he brought the eight tracks to Olympic Studios transferred them to a 16 track uh tape machine so the first eight were used up with the home stuff leaving the remaining eight tracks for the band to play on so the band played to pete's home recordings basically and That's to the track. so keep crazy man. To a click track that and, is a... <sighs> and so i had to track down not only the eight track originals that pete did at home but the olympic 16 track masters as well and that was, that was a, they were all over the country. They wow. were in some weird places. There was a school up in some city in the Midlands that had Who Masters in their library. Now, how they got there, I have no idea, but we tracked them down and got them back. And then we had to sync them up. That, that was another headache. We had to sync the 16 track to the eight track. And in those days, there was no time code on. Multiple. There's no digit. Yeah, yeah. This had, I, wow. And by very speed manipulation where, you know, when you hear one tape going slightly out of phase with the other, you'd know that they were starting to move out of sync. So you have to speed it up with a very speed button and then slow it down again so they would stay in sync and then record the results. So it was a technical nightmare, but great fun still. And then it got to the, the real fun part was getting your hands on those multi-tracks and bringing up the drum faders and listening to Keith Moon on two tracks. They recorded the drums on two tracks in those days. Glyn Johns was the engineer and he had a special technique with three mics onto two tracks and it sounded amazing. Um, but it was so much fun to listen to the isolated tracks and then mix it. Great fun to mix it, of course. But the, the, the Keith Moon stuff was great to listen to it and he would wander from the click, something terrible. Really? musical way that it didn't matter it was keith moon you know and oh, he's was, such a phenomenal drummer and and it was a huge part of the way that band sounded was the way he attacked those drums and when you listen to the drum tracks on their own every time he'd launch into a drum fill which is most of the time <laughs> yeah he, he you, did. Could him, you could hear him go which you don't hear on the record well actually now i can hear it on the records because i know you know what to listen really because so he would just be making like noises yeah. it's grunt you know as he how do you get rid of that you don't really you can hear it on the record but you, you wouldn't really notice it unless you knew it was there you know so, so it's because there's so much other things on top of it that it's buried oh, no. yeah um you know those drums of his were pretty bloody loud yeah um, yeah you know your ear goes to the drums, not the grunt, you know. Interesting. So you are the guy that remixed Quadrophenia for CD. That's where my claim starts to uh, lose um, cred. Why? 
because it came out, my understanding, I never really got a copy, which is so often the way, you know, it's hard to get a copy of your work sometimes. But it came out, um, Polydor was the Who's label, and they wanted to test the market for a remixed version of Quadrophenia in Germany first. And as far as I know, that's the only place it was released. My version of it was only released in Polydor, Germany. So now maybe it made its way to some future release of Quadrophenia. I don't know. But what's the release that's out there now? Well, that's probably just copies of the original master. And not the remastered. Why would, the one that we did. why would they not take the better? I don't know. I don't know. And it might be that, it might be that they used it. You just have no clue. I just don't know for sure. Interesting. Wow, what a good story, man. Did you get to ever uh, connect with Keith Moon or... or uh, no, Keith Moon had died be, uh, before. B before. Uh, how I about... Any of the other Who members. I didn't uh, meet Daughtry either. Oh, interesting. Wow, what a good story. What a great project to work on. Fantastic. So that was a highlight to answer your question. And Jeff Beck was, in, was the other. And uh, you said three, right? Yeah. Uh, third being... Uh, it's a lot to choose from, really. Cause oh, it's a great, what a great career you've had, man. Um, I was working with an artist called uh, Nick Lowe. Oh, yeah. A hit in America uh, called Cruel to be Kind. Yep. Song. And, and Nick was also uh, a, a, a well-respected producer. He produced mm. Elvis Costello and... Uh, rock pile and some Dave Edmonds stuff. He, he produced a lot of stuff. Yeah, a lot of guys in that genre, in that genre were were his. Yes, I, I remember there that. Was yeah. a gang of them, and they all worked on each other's records and stuff. Yeah, I was working on one of Nick's solo records. It was called Rose of England, and we were at Ilpai Townsend's place, and Nick got a phone call, and it was Elvis Costello. Now, um, now Nick lives just up the road. It's in a little place called uh, Chiswick. Mm -hmm. a few miles away from the studio. So Nick would always cycle to the studio and, uh, and he's, he'd leave his bicycle in the corridor, you know, he said, Oh, Nick's here, his bikes. And uh, he got a call and it was Elvis Costello and Elvis was asking Nick if he could encroach on his studio time just for an hour or so. Cause Elvis had some ideas for songs in his head and he wanted to put them down. So, uh, Nick's, you know, they were mates, obviously. And Nick said, yeah, yeah, of course, come over. Now, Elvis lived nearby as well. So he turned up on his bicycle as well. That's <laughs> funny. You know, it's like we needed a bike shed, you know. Yeah. So, uh, so Elvis walked in and, um, and was very humble and very apologetic about, you know, uh, gate crash in Nick's session. And... Um, and said, no, I'll try and be as quick as possible. Uh, do you have a guitar? Could I, could I borrow a guitar? And Nick, yeah, yeah, use my guitar. And uh, so Elvis went into the studio and I put a quick mic up and a mic for his vocal. And um, now I probably shouldn't say this, but uh, I love no, the time has passed. Um, I'll leave it up to you whether you include this or not. But enough time has passed whereby I think it's all right. But I used to, when I was wor working with people that I think, that I thought I could learn from, I'd have my own little tape recorder in mm. the control room and had a feed from the output of the board. Sure. If, if there was things I thought were interesting or I could use as reference, I would just hit record on my tape recorder at the back of the room, you know? Sure. That makes sense. That's I great. Can't, I can't pass this opportunity, opportunity up. Um, I have to record this. So I hit record on my tape recorder as Elvis goes in. And Elvis blows through three songs back to back, no stopping, just three songs. And he performs them flawlessly. His vocals were stunning. And the first song was a song called Peace in Our Time, which became a number one hit in England, but not under, uh, he didn't use the name Elvis Costello. He used a pseudonym called The Imposter. But it, everybody knew it was Elvis Costello. It was, he had such a distinct voice. And it was a number one hit. And I have the original demo of this. That's wild, man. And another one was a, a song called Tell Me Right Now. And, uh, and another one called One of Us, One of Us, 
goes or leaves or something like that, which subsequently uh, surfaced on one of his uh, uh, following albums. But these three songs are performed so brilliantly. That's so uh, cool, man. Real and a half to, to, to listen to and do it, never mind walk away with a pristine recording of, uh, and I've still got, got a recording of uh, uh, that particular recording is over on my tape shelf there. Very so, cool, man. I'm probably the only person in the world that has that recording. I think he walked away with a cassette. So, you know, me and Elvis. Now, is it true we'll be selling copies of that for, oh, yeah. for $1,000 each? <laughs> Limited to 20 people. We're yeah. only going to be able to make 20 grand off this. <laughs> That's so, great, man. That's really, what did, you, what did you learn from that? That one in particular? Oh, I don't know if it was a great, uh, it was just a thrill. Yeah. Uh, experience i mean i i probably learned that you know i'll never be able to play and sing like that <laughs> <laughs> that, that's really cool man it's nice that you did that that's really cool um so jeff beck pete and producing quadrophenia mastering quadrophenia and then nick blow El recording elvis costello that's nice man you grew up in east london which at that time, if I'm not mistaken, was a pretty rough area. Yeah, it didn't seem like it at the time. Um, it seemed all right. You know, we were just growing up on our street like everybody else, you know. But it, it was, you know, it was fairly rough. And by the time I was 12, uh, there was a pub at the end of our street. And on a weekend, it would get increasingly more violent as time passed, you know, and the fights started to spill out into our street and they would wreck cars Holy yeah. and stuff like that. And it got fairly ugly. And my dad said, right, that's it. We're moving out. And he moved us to the countryside, Ipswich. Right. Uh, where, uh, where my musical education started, I suppose, you know, right. big, big bands and stuff started in Ipswich. No, you have a big family or just were you only child no, or four of us four of us. okay very what? regular upbringing you know and and what i look back now on uh on that growing up in east london and and i realized well it was it, it was a fairly um poor area it, mm. again, it, it didn't seem like it at the time you well, when you're kids you know your environment is all you know obviously yeah um, but we didn't have the bathroom in the house until oh this this is going to sound like one of those Monty Python sketches. You know, <laughs> no man, with, uh, poor upbringings. But but we didn't have a bathroom till I was about ten, and up to that point we just had an outside toilet. It was in the garden, right? Wow, yeah, that's different, man. We had the same situation, so it wasn't like oh yeah. we only have one toilet and it's out in the garden. Everybody lived like that. Yeah, so it was in this little shed like a portaloo, you know. Right wooden shack thing and i do remember if you needed uh if you needed to pee in the middle of the night you'd have to get your what we call dressing gowns a robe yeah put your robe on then you have to put your coat on because in the middle of winter when you go outside it's freezing it's, you know it's it's painful so i do remember that and i remember me and my sister were you know my mum and dad would get uh this, this is getting a little uh, nostalgic now which is getting a bit off the music topic but no no that's good that's good man uh but my mum and dad would uh go down to the public baths once a week saturdays on saturdays they'd go to the public baths and that would be their bath for yeah. the entire week yeah yeah that's pretty common back then and, well it was, certainly was in those days uh you know and moving to california you know where people have a shower every five minutes you know it's quite different to the way i was brought up um, so they would have their, their weekly bath, whether they needed it or not. <laughs> no. um, and <laughs> whether they needed it or not. That's great, man. <laughs> You're taking a bath today, whether you like it or not. Yeah. You know, they've only been stinking for a week. That's funny. Uh, but, uh, us kids, we'd have one of those tin baths, like you see on Little House on the Prairie. You know, they yeah. get, my, get this tin bath out, put it in front of the fire, and uh, fill it up with hot water boiled in the kettle. Right. And, uh, and us kids would have a bath in that thing. Until That's we got wild, there. man. We thought we were royalty when we had that bathroom put in. 
it was so much fun. Did you have kids? I have kids. Yeah. Do you ever like threaten them? Say, Hey, listen, don't bitch. Yeah, I, <laughs> yeah. But they just roll their eyes, you know, oh, he's off again about his toilet outside, you know? Yeah. I had a walk up, I had a walk up hill, I walk up hill both ways to school. Yeah. They've had <laughs> all that stuff and it just washes over them, you know, can yeah. I have an iPhone? That's there. Yeah. What's funny in 93, Anne brought me back to my wife, brought me back to her mom's in Dunstable and I get there and it was, it was cold too. And I'm like, uh, I'm like, where's the shower? She goes, there's no shower. I'm like, what do you mean? And I had a fucking bathe, man. I don't bathe. I take a shower. It was, and this is 93. That's, you know, quite a while ago. And, uh, so I, I could easy see that situation very, quite to be very realistic. Dunstable was, it depends what part, of course, but Dunstable was a fairly low income, working class area. Very much. Yeah, very much. Her mom was like, worked in a car. Uh, what was the, um, Vauxhall? Yeah, Vauxhall. Everybody in the neighborhood worked at the- right. At Vauxhall. Yeah, that's exactly, yeah, exactly the way it was. And, uh, I, and, and what was funny is, as an American, as a guy from New York, which is even worse, um, <laughs> she was really excited because there was a new Tesco <laughs> opening. So here I am, my first time in Europe. I'm in, I'm in Dunstable, you know, and uh, I've got to go. And, and again, I'm a New York guy. And I'm sitting there, I'm like, this is, you got to be kidding me. You know, I was happy for her that, you know, I was very happy that she was happy, excited, but I didn't, it was lost on me, man. Yeah, that's a big deal. I mean, it was yeah. ages before we got one of those, you know, truly supermarkets. Yeah. Or we would call supermarkets anything that sold more than one item. You know, if you <laughs> you're washing up detergent and your, and your cake mix in the same shop, that was a supermarket. You know, right. but it was years after you guys had them. We had those monster things. Yeah. Anything you can imagine, you know. Yeah, it was funny, man. And then uh, she was... What, what's that? I'm not surprised she was excited. Oh, she was thrilled. And I was happy for her because, you know, like you just had, it was nostalgia for her. And then, but, uh, and then she goes, oh, I can't wait to get the clotted cream. And then like some of that's lost on me because I didn't grow up there, you know, so I don't know what, how that good that feels. And it was just funny, like all this enthusiasm over Tesco. It was just, it was yeah. cute, you know, it was a, I it was, was happy for her. but excited in those days. <laughs> yeah, different. And, and we uh, here in the States don't really know that because, um, it's just just a different society a little bit you know where uh i think we have more creature comfort and we still have more creature comforts than probably anywhere too many yeah in probably. some cases what were, were your folks supportive of you playing music yeah they were they were now i think about it i mean yeah uh i don't think they ever imagined that i would make a career out of it but right. Because at the time, in those days in East London in particular, you know, my schooling was extremely basic. Mm. Uh, and we were basically being molded into doing blue coat Laborers. And, or yeah. really, you were expected to do what your dad did for a living. Yeah. My best mate's dad was a, post, um, a mailman. And, and he became a mailman and, you know, they're, they're all doing something connected with their dad's job. Mostly it was a bit of yeah. a generalization, but generally that's, that's where we ended up. And my dad being a truck driver that looked like I was going to go that way too, which was fine by me, you know? Yeah, he, of course. He liked his job and I thought it looked okay. You know, I would do that. Sure. Um, so I think, um, when I eventually got into, I, I don't think they were that impressed by me being in bands. I don't think they ever thought that that was going to go anywhere and they were right. <laughs> yeah. But, but once I started getting paid for being, for doing studio work and especially, I remember the turning point when I bought my first house, uh, which was just a, a few miles up the road for them. You know, it was it wasn't a palace by any means, but, no, but was, you're a kid buying a house. It's and uh, uh, I think then they went, oh, he, he, this is a real job after all. You know, because I think at first they they felt it was just an extension of being in a band. Yeah, you know, oh, he just records bands now instead of plays in them. But then when I got the house, uh, you know, I scored a point. But they, they must. That's you know. Props to them because, you know, not often that you got laborers 
or blue collar workers because they probably grew up in the same and then they're they are that supportive of you doing that so that was really cool yeah it was uh they never put any restrictions on me or expectations i mean it was kind of a unspoken expectations that you would do what your dad did but they never uh that's wagged me into into anything really that, that's very cool i think you know, stay out of jail and they were happy <laughs> i know the bar's low i feel you on that man Happened. Speaking of which, what were some of the low points, maybe, or the darker uh, stuff that you've had to deal with in life, and how'd you get through it? Uh, you know, um, I've been pretty blessed with the 63 years. There's awesome. not been much to complain about. I suppose the darkest. Uh, the, the career, really, there was nothing to complain about in the career. Obviously, some gigs are better than others. But really nothing to that you know created a, a dark period of time per se but I suppose the only thing I had to battle was uh, a health issue in 2000 uh, I got uh, cancer I went through the whole uh, radiation treatment thing um, and came out the other end unlike you so I'm grateful as hell for that um, but that was uh, that was made worse by the fact that our first daughter was uh, only a year old at that time. Mm. So there was that black cloud of, well, what if I don't make it through this? Then you know, this poor kid. You know, so so that made it seem darker than it really was. Yeah. Well, cancer's dark. My wife had cancer in '98, man. So I I haven't gone through it, but I was by her side. It's fucking dark it's man pretty grim, but you know going into it i had no more clue than anybody else that i'd come out the other side so just the fact that it's possible if it comes back you know hopefully not if it comes yeah. back i'll know that it's possible because i've done it so that would give me renewed determination did you make any like health life changes like are you healthier or to eat better or anything like that yeah uh on paper, I don't, want to do it. you know, I like everybody, you know, you go through something like that and I've got friends who have been through similar situations and, and they've made sweeping changes in their life and they've, and they, and they talk about moments where when after the recovery, they say it, it gives you renewed outlook on life and, and you're more determined to do the right things and you appreciate every morning you wake up, you're grateful. And I must be a cynical old git or something because I never got that. You know, I, when I was after, when I recovered from it, I remember going, Oh no, it's Monday tomorrow and I've got to do this, this and this, you know, I, I went straight back to being, <laughs> complaining old bastard <laughs> so i never got that moment of oh every day is a blessing yeah. Uh, but yeah i changed a few things uh, yeah. you're more you are more appreci appreciative i'm just joking really. good man i'm glad that everything worked uh, yeah. for you of course man and it's been a long time so uh it's funny i had this com the the uh tom Britt, who i interviewed this morning had cancer just three years ago mm -hmm. so we had a very similar conversation about he's that he's okay it now yeah, and he had cancer, and then I think the chemo caused a lump in his throat, but that was Hodgkin's lymphoma, which apparently is very easy. You know, like I guess when you he had like penile cancer that came from HPV virus somehow, and so I guess when you've been through that, it, it, you know, a little lump on your throat, and you know, I guess it w was That's easy. I know this isn't quite the same thing, but it does give you a kind of sense of invincibility. I know that's, that's kind of um, crap in a way because, you know, none of us are. You just get a sense that you can deal with anything that comes your way. Yeah. yeah. Right or wrong, I, it just gives you that sense that anything that might catch you out in, in the future, you can handle. You got it. That's good, man. And I, mean, I don't know if there's a right or wrong in this. I don't, I don't think there's a, I think every, like, how do people handle cancer? This is different for everybody. How do people handle religion? How do people, I mean, this is like an, an, a personal journey. So if that's what the net effect with you is, you know, Hey, good for you. The point is that you're here and you made it and that's great. And whatever, in my opinion, anyway, whatever 
outlook you have on it is your prerogative because it was your cancer in your journey. You know? Absolutely. And having, having a kid yeah. gives you that impetus as well to not give up. Um, I remember my kid was, you know, extremely young and she came up to me while I was laying on the sofa, you know, groaning. And she came up to me with a coloring book and said, can you help me color? Can you help me color? And it was a huge effort to get off that bloody sofa and sit there coloring, you know, but you have to do it. Yeah, man. You sensed something wrong, then it's downhill from there. You know, so that definitely gave me a shot in the arm to, we've got to get through this somehow, you know. Good, man. Well, I'm really but, happy. You know, that's really the only. You know, that's a big one, man. You don't need a, you, you get a pass if that's the only one you have, you know. That's... Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm grateful for the rest of it, you know. Well, thanks for sharing that, man. I appreciate that. And uh, Tony mentioned he's 63. And I got to tell you, if you're listening to this as opposed to watching this, the guy looks like he's in his late 40s, early 50s. So he's coming uh, out with an, an anti-age cream in the next episode. <laughs> Is that what you do? Do you nap? Yeah. <laughs> really? Do you, how often do you nap? Because I've heard that. I said, it's an app. Oh, it's an app. Oh, okay. I thought you said I nap. I'm like, let's do that. Yeah, man. Well, that's good enough. We could sell that. Uh, Talk about, you know, what's that? Talking of naps, I could do one. There you go, man. Uh, Talk about maybe some things that you did that were out of your comfort zone initially, but you did them anyway, and they turned into, you know, good big breaks for you or or positive opportunities. Uh, I don't know. Uh, There was some, some tricky moments. I don't know if they turned out positive or not. I suppose the one that qualifies for that, or at least the one that springs to mind, was I was working for a record company in England called Phonogram, uh, initially as a mixing engineer. And one gig in particular involved doing a little bit more than just mixing. You know, it's cleaning up some bits and pieces and adding some guitar here and there. Very basic stuff. Um, um, and so I gave them back a little more than they gave me to mix, you know? Yeah. Um, and so they decided that I was producer material and I was hesitant about swanning around calling myself a producer. And I knew I didn't have the right personality. It's a special kind of person that you have to be to be an effective producer. It's not just having good ideas. You know, you have to be so much more than that. And I knew on the personal side of what you have to be to be a good producer, I wasn't it, but I kind of, agreed and and i i agreed to produce this new band they'd signed which ended up being the band my wife was the vocalist in. <laughs> wow okay that went okay i produced their record their first record and it was fairly i i coped fairly well because they were a first time in the studio band in a pro studio anyway so they were all fairly green and so anything i said they took as they listened to you, yeah and um so it was fairly easy on the managing the people front. And it was a pleasant record. They were all great people. And I think we made a, a semi-decent record in the end. You know, we came out with some good stuff. Um, and then uh, my confidence was boosted by that experience. And then the record company went, well, if you can handle that, you can handle this. And they gave me this, this seasoned rock and roll band from Glasgow, right? You know, right there. Yeah. Which is pretty, hard. yeah, pretty rough. In hard living, no nonsense, a New York mentality. You know, yeah. to New York, and uh, and they gave me this this band to produce called Love and Money, and Love and oh, Money yeah. previously worked with the guy who did Steely Dan, and they wanted to do their own record this time. They didn't want a producer; they wanted to produce themselves, but the record company insisted on having someone at the reins to you know, keep them on track. And uh, so I got sent up there in the middle of winter and Glasgow is freezing. If you think Dunstable's cold, Glasgow is <laughs> And so I got sent up there as the record company's producer, you know, which I wasn't, I was freelance like any other gig, but they saw me as the record company guy. So I was instant, instantly blackballed the minute I walked in. And there was these, this hard, big, hard-nosed, well-experienced rock and roll band, hard drinking, you know, a uh, bunch of yobs. <laughs> and I was the weedy southerner 
being sent up to produce their re record for them. So there was a lot of abuse. <laughs> um, wow. And uh, just it, generally giving you a hard time. Yeah, general. I mean, it was kind of loosely wrapped uh, in in fun, in with the idea of fun, but it wasn't. It was pretty nasty. It's really fun for them, <laughs> not for you. And and what made it worse is that it was a really cold winter, and they put me up in this ancient flat that you uh, that the electricity supply is on a coin meter. So oh when my god, the electric goes off, right? So, and I didn't know this. So my first night there, I'm in bed and I'm woken up by the sheer drop in temperature, right? And I see that there's no electric, there's no electric light and everything. So I'm, I'm calling the manager of the studio. This is the only number I have. It's in the middle of the night. Right? I'm going, there's no power. Is there a power cut? What's going on? He goes, no, you have to put money in the meter. So is I'm that common? I've never even heard of that. Was then. I'm sure wow. there's a few of them left. And it, and it wasn't that common. I'd only ever seen a couple of houses with electric meters, you know, and that was in East London. But they were still around in this part of Glasgow anyway. Wow. So I'm calling the studio manager up. He goes, no, you have to put money in. I didn't have any coins on me. You know, it was the middle of the night. And, and so I have to put my coat on and get back in bed. So I go to the studio the next day and start bitching and moaning about the temperature and the electric meter and you're all living like, cavemen and you know and so I, i'm kind of you know cooking my own goose at that point and it's going downhill and downhill um but eventually so that was the toughest situation i ever had to deal with but i thought well i can I either go running back to london and be the wimpy southerner that they're accusing me of being or i can try and get this project finished and clearly they don't want someone telling them how to play their music and, you know, in a way, I didn't blame them because they were good. They were a really good band, great musicians. Um, uh, James was a great songwriter, the lead vocalist. And, um, and they knew their stuff. You know, they'd been playing together for a long time. They really didn't need a producer, but they didn't need an engineer. So I played my role down from producer to engineer. And then things started to relax and I got them some results that they liked. They liked the, say, the way the things were sounding. Great. Suddenly started to relax and we ended up being drinking pals. <laughs> oh, that's cool. So everything worked. Near as much as they did. Those guys can drink. Scotty, yeah. but they are, that's a huge generalization, but, but they would come in the studio every day, every day. They'd come in and they would sit on the sofa at the back of the control room and they'd be silent and I'd be working on stuff and play them some ideas. And, uh, and I turn around, what do you think lads? And they'd all be sitting there like this, you know, head in hands going, Oh, my head, you know, <laughs> drinking the night before every day they would do that. Wow. Unbelievable. Those guys can drink. <laughs> yeah. I don't know how people function they, like that. You know, it turned out well, they were, they, they were great blokes in the end. And, uh, and it was an enjoyable situation. So that I think qualifies yeah. at the time that a tricky situation ended up being all right. What was that record called? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. It's a long time ago. It's uh, your name on that one. Uh, I really can't remember. It was the album after the one they did with the Steely Dan guy, which yielded a, a hit for them. Uh, I can't remember what that is called. I'll do a little bit of homework and get back. I'm curious. Um, um, good though. Great musicians. From a guitar standpoint, if if you had to pick the best guitar and the best amp, best is whatever your, you know, what would you say the best guitar and the best amp to record in the studio is? Mm. Uh, usually, if I was wearing my engineer's hat and I was trying to make a point. I'd be all kind of flippant and say, oh, there's no such thing as the best amp, best guitar. Um, because it's all in the musician's fingers. And I do believe that. Yeah. You, know, you can give the same guitar and amp to five different guitarists and they'll all sound different. And, um, and I've always maintained that in not just guitar, uh, in, in, the, uh, in the aspect of a guitar sound, but anything, any recorded sound, generally I apply that thinking to. In as much as I'm not big on the gear, it really doesn't bother me what the mic pre is. 
um, mics obviously are a little more sensitive and mm. and you have to apply certain mics to certain situations but even then it's not that important what's the most important thing that determines whether a sound is considered good or not is the performer fair enough man that's a great answer most of 90 percent of the quality of the sound is coming from the guy or girl's fingers and uh, obviously there's exceptions to that but generally speaking i've found that to be true and people tend to uh, budding engineers tend to focus way too much on the gear the brand right. on the mic pre when you know yeah one mic pre can sound different to another and it might uh, enhance this particular thing that you're recording at this moment but most of it comes from the source fair enough man now i think having said that um an engineer can play an important part with the gear he chooses to use because he can screw it up by using the wrong gear right okay gear does play an important part in that regard if an engineer doesn't know what he's doing and puts the mic in the wrong place and uses the completely wrong mic for the application it can screw up what you're trying to capture but if you halfway know what you're doing it's all going to be in the fingers that's a great answer man thank voice you for the voice if it's a vocal and that is more uh, a better example than an instrument really the sound of a, a vocalist whether it's a good vocal sound or not is usually their ability to project along those lines tell me the top three guitar players that you've uh, enjoyed working with uh, got to be jeff beck at the top of that list um uh close somewhere up the top is doug bossy oh awesome it's got to be i mean the guy is is fantastic <laughs> he's, a, he's a great player he's replaced um uh, Lukather in lost lobotomies uh yeah. their recent album i mixed for them and uh it, it was great fun not only is doug playing fantastically throughout that record he's the band's guitarist after all but they got some some guest guitarists in Jonah Bonamassa and a host of names. And it's really fun to listen to if you're into great playing. Yeah. I love that album. The record is fantastic. Um, but, uh, but if we're talking about guitarists, Doug is up there and, uh, and he's my workmate. Yeah. Yeah. We're friends. It's, yeah. it's, it's great. It's great when your mates are brilliant at something. You know what I mean? Yeah. He's a very smart guy in general. Good business well, person as well. Um, uh, I also worked uh, only one uh, one time, but I worked with Gary Moore. Wow. Um, he did a song with, I think it was a one-off. I could be wrong about that, but they came to Eel Pie and they did a song called Out in the Fields. Yeah, from that was from uh, when he, he went... Um, Bill Lennon. Yes, but he went sort of like metal for, uh, not metal, but hard rock sort of for before he went into, yeah, that's a gr that was the name of the, the album, I think, too, Out in the Fields. Probably. I only yeah. worked on one song. Um, I think it was a single because they did a video for it while we were in the studio. There's a guy running around with a camera. It was a single. Uh, Gary's, um, Gary's guitar playing, and they stuck the camera on the end of his uh, guitar machine head. It was the first time anybody had seen it. So when you see the video, you see the, you know, what it's like to look down the neck of a guitar, you know, because it was years before GoPros and stuff. Um, what was that like? And what was, what was he, he like to work with? And what was that experience? Was, was he playing as, uh, as Peter Green, Les Paul? Yes. Yeah. What, what was uh, that experience like? It, it was phenomenal. If we're, if we're talking about, you know, guitarists that have uh, blown you away, it's, uh, that, that's up there. He was brilliant. He did. He, he made many attempts at the solo on that record, but every solo was fantastic. And they were all completely different, of course. Um, whereas some guitarists I've worked with have their solos at least mapped out roughly, and you can hear them working within that map. Um, but he was just, he didn't know what was going to come out, you know, and he would do lots and lots of solos and pick his favorite, but really any one of them would have done. <laughs> they were all fantastic. What was his personality like? Um, I, I didn't get to interact with him that much, just recorded that day's worth of work and that yeah. was it. We all went out to dinner afterwards, I think, and I remember 
uh, I remember it was snowing and Phil Lynott was coming out the restaurant, slipped and fell and smashed his nose and there was blood everywhere. Oh my God. <laughs> um, I remember that about the session. Uh, but uh, th yeah, there wasn't, it's not like Gary and I walked out arm in arm, you know? Um, yeah. It was just a day's work, but he was very inspirational from a guitar point of view. Incredible tone and vibrato that guy had. It wasn't pompous or difficult in any way. Most people aren't really. Most people are yeah. great yeah, because they've got a job to do, you know, and if, if they start pissing people off. However, there, are, there has been a couple <laughs> that don't qualify as being all right to work with, um, but most people are. Anybody you could say? Yeah. Uh, well, not difficult to work with, but unpleasant to be around. And that was Van Morrison. Really? I'm not the only one to say that. You Interesting. Know, the reputation of being. And you seem like the easy, you seem like so easy to deal with, to be honest with you, man. But that was a one-off. Again, that was a one-off. I didn't work on a whole album. That would have been different. Either he would have, you know, relaxed and warmed and been okay to work with. I'm sure he is, but it was a one-off gig. It was definitely high pressure for all of us on that session. Um, it, was, it wasn't for an album of his. It was for a one-off, either charity record or something like that. I can't remember what the song was called. Um, but he didn't want... I think he wasn't really into it. That was the vibe I got. Um, uh, and he wanted to record everything at once. And in those days, even more than now, we recorded one instrument at a time. At most, you'd get bass and drums done together. Yeah. But really, it was drums, and then you add one after the other, right? And it's fairly laborious. I think now people tend to try and get as much of the band playing together as possible. I think that makes sense. I think, you know, that would be a good thing if you can get it. Um, but in those days, we did everything piecemeal. And he turned up and he insisted on doing everything, including his vocal. As oh, wow, which is always put on last. Yep, as a live take in the studio. Now, to add to the chaos, he wanted backing vocals. Uh, he had a backing vocal group, four girls. He had a brass section. Uh, he had piano, organ, two guitars, and drums. And we were in a studio called uh, Eden Studios in West London at the time. And um, it wasn't a huge studio, so it was already squashed, having all those people and their instruments in the studio. And we had a one booth for his vocal. Uh, I think we had another booth, but he didn't want people in the booth. He wanted one sound. And that's how we had to approach it. Uh, because there was so much spill. There was drums spilling on everything, obviously. They're, in the mic. They're the loudest instrument in the room. There's drums on, the, on the, the backing vocal mics, the brass mics, and the piano mics. So we had to approach it. There was, there was two engineers on the session, me and uh, Mick Glossop his regular engineer. And, um, and we had to approach it in a completely different way. And I was fairly new then. This was be before, oh, wait a minute. Oh no, I was moonlighting. I'd already got the job at Eel Pie and I moonlighted for this one session. At, at so Eel. you had another, another session, yeah. Yeah, it was just a one-off. I knew the guys that, um, that ran the studio. And so I was helping out because they knew it was a, a, a hectic session. Um, but I was still cutting my teeth at that point, and, and this was all new to me, this live in the studio business. So we decided to just approach it in a way that we used the spill. So we used, you do that? we used a lot, we used very little of the close mics on the drums because there was so much drums in the uh, room spilling onto all the mics that we just fed in the kick drum mic and the snare mic and the occasional tom mic if needed whenever they were played and um, just enough to give the the kit some point um, and the rest was just spill onto everybody else's mic but the point of the story is once we were all set up van morrison turns up no hellos no shaking hands he just you know are you ready you guys ready yes we're ready van he went out to his vocal booth and he, of course, he, he sang the song incredibly well. I mean, it was just amazing, his vocal performance. Um, not in a kind of, oh, what a great performance that was, Van, you know. It was just perfect for the song. It was a very languid song and had a big build at the end. And he just, he just sailed over the top of that backing track, you know, and just pulled everything together with this incredible vocal performance. And then he left. No goodbyes, nothing. 
The only person he spoke to was his manager, Bruce Willis. Had, I'm assuming the band had rehearsed this song before together? Okay. Uh, band, but I think he he'd got in the backing vocalist and the brass section. Okay. One off. Wow. That's too bad. But I mean, but it he could sounds have been, like, you know, hmm? not enjoying the situation. He could have been put under pressure to do that track, but. Yeah, but you can't make your problems other people's problems. Yeah, exactly. I mean, like, you know? It doesn't take much just to. Yeah. Man, yeah. hello and thank you and shit like that gets you pretty far. Yeah, and when people are devoting their entire day to, you know, your person. Yeah. No, that's but, too bad. That's too bad. Um, but, you know, I think I, I, in my exposure in a little over 600 interviews, the amount of arrogance is very, I mean, I always say the asshole ratio is very low, very, very low. I mean, honestly. Well, people need you there to, to get the result they want, you know? So they're not going to, you know, shit all over you. Well, I think most people too, especially nowadays, are so grateful that they get to do music for a living, you know? Um, yeah. And I, that attitude, you know, it's sincere yeah. with them, most, almost everyone. So I think that yeah, I'd comes out. I'd agree. Hey, tell me your uh, top three Desert Island, I'll say CDs, because I know Desert Island Discs, we said to an English person, they give you singles. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Desert Island CDs, no particular yeah. order, and just for now, because I know that could change. Well, um, I'd like to portray myself as incredibly cool and name a load of stuff that nobody's ever heard of. <laughs> I'm on the cutting edge of some, you know. Yeah, you're on the cutting edge of uh, engineering sound. No, no. My my records I would choose in that situation would be old, familiar, fond memory albums like Rubber Soul has to be in there. Mm -hmm. uh, I would bring an Ed Sheeran album. Um, I never know what to call his records because every one of them is a bloody mathematics symbol. Oh, are they? I'm not familiar with this, yeah, this record. I either multiply or divide, or I think it's the album called Divide. I would take that because he's a brilliant songwriter and that's a great album. But for me, that album kind of unified me and the family. My family here, my two daughters, my wife. Because that's the only album that we all agree on. Oh, you all like it. Oh, okay. It's an album for in the car road trips. Okay, I get you. We all love that album. And it kind of bonded us when we, we did it. It was kind of last year, maybe the year before, I don't know. We were on a long car trip and we took that record with us. And uh, not gotcha. only is it an album, but it kind of, you know, tied us all together for that trip. That's cool, man. That, bring that one. That's okay. one more record than my family has that ties us together. <laughs> 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 yeah, there's a lot of vision, you know, outside that record, there's a lot of arguing and stuff. Yeah, that's no, cool, man. Um, I would well, definitely bring Songs in the Key of Life. Stevie Wonder. Real uh, popular. And, and good old classics, you know, that everybody thinks you're uncool for liking, but Dark Side of the Moon and Led Zeppelin, name a number. I don't know <laughs> what Led Zeppelin album would do. Yeah. Uh, but Dark Side of the Moon, uh, there was a period where you didn't even mention that record now. For Fever. Really? That's my number one. I'd have that before any other record. England, America's much more forgiving about things that slip out of fashion. Uh, America, I think, is much it, yeah, more this is, it is. old bands still doing tours, doing nostalgia tours, you know? And they welcome that with open arms. Whereas England is a bit more cynical when people try and uh, when a band like Coldplay, right? Great yeah, band. Great that band. guy's a great writer. He's not the greatest singer in the world, but he's a great songwriter. Incredible. And they make um, but the minute Coldplay, Coldplay started to drop in, in coolness, then they were shunned by the, um, um, this is a huge generalization. Of really? Coldplay. But it was uncool to like Coldplay. I have a friend of mine in England that I'm still in good communication with, and he's an engineer. And I mentioned to him, I like the new Coldplay album. And he went, Coldplay? <laughs> you know, and that's a, a typical Interesting. attitude. When they're not at the forefront of cutting edge latest thing, people tend to shun them. And it's uncool to mention their name anymore. Whereas America are much more embracing of, if they're good, they're good for a long time, you know? Um, That's interesting. I right. think what I've, it, I'm sorry, go ahead. 
No, go on, go on, Kevin. I was just going to say, one thing I have noticed is that musicians and everybody involved in music, here anyway, is incredibly open to any music. Like, there's no judgment at all, with, with one exception of guys that don't like modern country music. But uh, with, with that exception, I mean, like, everybody's, like, so open to anything yeah, I and I've gotten turned on to so much cool shit from that, yeah. you know, that attitude. I'm surprised that in the music industry in England, it's not. The There's same. a lot of snobbery there, uh, linked to fashion and the latest thing, you know. Interesting. Everything, the latest thing. Having said that, though, there's period. If you wait long enough, some albums are great enough where they transcend that period of being uncool, and then they come back. They come back. <laughs> one of those. Oh, know? that's my <laughs> number one. I. Creates yeah. such a brilliant atmosphere. You can, I would take that with me. That's I mean, that, to listen to that record over great headphones or just even in a car where it's airtight, man, it's just, there's yeah. nothing, nothing like that, man. Brilliant, brilliantly engineered uh, by Alan Parsons. Alan Parsons, yeah. Incredible. Uh, Chris Thomas, actually, who I worked with uh, uh, because he worked he, as a, he produced Pete Townsend's White City album that I was referring to earlier. Uh, Chris Thomas produced that, and Chris Thomas also, from Island Records. Wasn't it? Isn't he? Didn't he own Island Records? I think he. I don't know if he owned it. I think he was. Uh, he had a strong connection to Island. I'm not too sure, to be honest. I know he worked with the Beatles, and that was enough for me. You know. Yeah. Yeah. Kept bugging him for questions about what was it like when you do it. You know, he worked on the White Album with the Beatles. Oh, I didn't know that. That's pretty cool. Um, so he now he. Uh, I forget what his official credit is on the album, but he oversaw the mix of Dark Side of the Moon. He was like a consultant. I don't think he got a full production credit. He might have done, but he was there with Alan Parsons kind of directing the mix. Wow. I didn't know that. That's really amazing. Brain to pick. And I did. Wow. Good guy too. Hey, um, best decision you ever made? Um, best decision. Uh, well, I suppose it would have to be to leave Horizontal Brian and pursue an engineering career, but that was almost the, uh, that was also the most difficult. Um, but next to that, the best decision I ever made was once I'd started a family and this happened soon after I started a family because my wife and I both agreed that me being locked up in some studio in town or in another country sometimes wasn't going to be conducive to starting a family, right? So what can we do? How can we, you know, fix this? Uh, home studios weren't uh, an option in those days. But I, with my last dollar, I think it was, I bought a Pro Tools rig and they were expensive in those days because the industry was going that way. It was moving from the massive boards to computers. And so I thought, well, I'm not going to get left behind. I'll buy a Pro Tools rig and learn how it works. So I moved into my garage in the house and it really was a garage. It wasn't converted into a studio. It was a garage, you know? And I thought, well, if I learn how this Pro Tools rig works, I might be able to work from home. So it soon became apparent that I, um, I, I just finished working with Celine Dion, right? So I still got Celine Dion going around in my brain and it soon became apparent that, you know, bringing Celine Dion over into my garage, you know, we'll, we'll you know, watch out for those tins of paint, Celine. Yeah. Ride your coat on those bikes. That, that wasn't going to work. So I started morphing from mixing into producing music for whoever would pay me to do it. And the first person to pay me to do it was a, a, a commercial agency. Uh, with TV commercials. So I started to write commercials for those guys and it, it paid me a wage. So, you know, I thought, well, maybe this is the answer. I work in my garage, I'm at home with the kid and I get paid for it. So, but, th but that quickly led to um, a gig on a TV show. Okay. Turned into Extreme Makeover Home Edition that became a massive hit. So that opened the door for my writing music for TV part of my career. That's great. 
doing that now and I'm still working at home, but now I've graduated from the garage to a room above the garage. Yeah, yeah, man. That's I still think you should have had Celine Dion over. She could she yeah, could hang her she could hang her coat on the Nordic track just like everybody else, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I don't know. So good story, man. We figured, we figured it out in the end. And you know, I've got to even though it's still not ideal because I've spent more time up in this room than I have, you know, with my kids over the years, which I regret. Um, but but that's least, man, it's hard to be an entrepreneur because I've worked for myself 21 years yeah. and I always did like there's certain like I co we coached our kids in the snap but man even though the saving grace is same as you I was always home yes exactly you got that for you know those moments when you do yeah you know? I need help with homework or you know can you well, make I was me very good at that my wife was much better at that than me but you know educated in East London my kids know 20 times more than I do already. sure totally but, get that so, but yeah. that you're home though, but you know, dad, can you make me a sandwich or stuff like that? Yeah. You know, yeah. so it's kind of like you make up for it when you can. Yeah. It's so, you know, we found the best solution possible, I think. Yeah. It's not ideal, but you know, as soon as I can't do anything else whatsoever, other than music related jobs, there was no option. I had to make music work. Yeah. So, and now everybody's got a studio in their house, but. Yeah. And you did, man. And you, yeah. you made it work. Figured it out. Hey, this is a very American, or at least a very un-British question. <laughs> what do you like most about yourself? Oh, yeah, that is an American question. Yeah. Uh, I'll pretend to pause because it's so... <laughs> 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 but there is one thing I'm quite proud of and continue to be pleased with, is that I look for ways to get better at mixing all the time. Even though my, my primary bread and butter now is earned from writing music for TV shows, I still mix whenever I can and whenever anyone wants me to do it. Um, I mix for clients that I've known in the past, friends I've known in the past, somebody that has heard a record that I've done and wants me to mix it. I, I always say yes, because I love mixing. It's what I feel most comfortable with. Writing music for TV, I can pull it off because I know how to make it sound good because of my engineering abilities. But musically, I use guitar primarily and I'm a very average guitarist. So my musicality is extremely limited, but my engineering makes up for it and I can deliver a presentable product in the end. But mixing is my passion and it's what I'm best at. And with each project I mix, I learn something. I still, I'm still learning. I'm still getting better after all this time. And I love it. So I'm, I'm most proud of that attribute, I think. That's cool, man. And I'm going to tell uh, listeners at the end how you can get a hold of Tony if you're interested in having him uh, do some mixing work for you. Very good. Fl flip side. Do it. If you could change one thing about yourself, what would it be? Oh man, what is this therapy or something? What? You know what Doug says every time Doug listens, he goes, Craig, you got to change this to everyone loves therapy. <laughs> so Doug says that all the time. We're years. heading that way, 100 mile an hour here. Uh, yeah, but that's a different for an English person and an American. Definitely. Is. Yeah, right. the velocity is about 10 times higher what, for you guys. What don't I like about myself? Is that what you said? No, no, not what don't, you know, what would you, one thing you'd like to change? Oh, all right. Not, you don't have to not like it. Oh, well, I've got plenty of those as well, though. <laughs> One thing I'd change is that, and I would definitely, anyone listening that is just getting started, just getting going in the, in the entertainment industry, it doesn't even have to be music. This is an ugly thing to say, really, um, but it's a business like everything else. And you need to network and you need to get around and you need to meet people, as many people as you can, gay crash the parties, if you have a friend who's a friend of someone who works in the industry, get in there, make yourself a pest and get comfortable at, at getting yourself around and networking, talk to people. I'm lousy at that. Um, it's still biting me in the ass even now after all these years and after all these accolades and, and um, achievements, it still bites me in the ass that I don't go out and network. Yeah. So that's, uh, my biggest failure professionally there's many others personally but um but that one's the biggest detrimental effect on my career 
Well, it's interesting. You said something earlier that made me think of that. You said when you were um, mixing, uh, I think it was, uh, gosh, I'm sorry. It, maybe it was with El Elvis Costello. It was somebody you were telling a story about when you were mixing and you said they didn't realize that I was, oh, when it was your wife's, your manager's. Right. Uh, Wait, was when your, I, with Joni? Yes. And yeah. you said they didn't realize that I only got the job because. Yeah, because my, I knew, knew but that. I thought to myself, that's how everybody gets jobs. Absolutely. Is. You, you know, and, it, and it, it doesn't matter necessarily experience or talent. Yeah. I mean, you have to be competent, of course, yeah. but like. Once you get it, you have to keep it. And that's when it's down to you and your abilities. Right. But get the job in the first place. It's very little to do with your ability. It's everything to do with the way you promote yourself and how many irons in the fire that you have in as many places as you, as you can find to put them. Yeah. And, and who you, who, it's like who you know is going to open the door for you. Now, you better keep it open with your competency and your performance. Yep, but that's later. First, you have to get that door open. That's the yeah. trick. Yeah, um, and I have uh, I have a friend who is a little bit older than I I was, and he was in the band. He was in he's in a band. Um, I think it's all right to say his name. I, I'm sure he wouldn't mind. Um, but he used to be my roommate when I first came out here. I uh, uh, took a room in the house owned by Ricky Phillips. Oh, from Sticks, bass player. Well, he's in Sticks now. He was in Bad English. He right, was in okay. Babies, then he was in Bad English. And, uh, and through his connection, I got to work with John Waite, the vocalist. From in the Babies. English. And John and I did a few records together. Um, but that was purely because of the Ricky Phillips connection. Um, but Rick always used to say, now Rick is a golfer. And he always used to say that he's made more connections on the golf course with industry professionals and artists yeah. Alex Cooper is, a, is a, a golf enthusiast. And Ricky got to meet uh, Alex playing golf. And he uh, got right, Alex Cooper, yeah. And artists and business people alike. And Ricky's got the, the, the personality that ingratiates you to him anyway. You know, he's very mm -hmm. likable bloke. But, you know, he went out and learned to play golf and made a ton of connections because of it. I mean, that's only, it's not like everybody has to go and learn to play golf but but with something that you have an, an opportunity to to so connect important. yeah exactly yeah Me, that's important however, whatever way you can figure it out yeah oh dude I, you're preaching to the choir on that one man let me tell you nobody knows that better than me i'm lousy at that so that's been my biggest uh, uh you know um negative aspect of what i've done or not done yeah i get it man uh who's had the biggest influence on you Musically and professionally. Um, well, it would be obvious to say Townsend because I was such a big fan and ended up working with him. And it was true to say that he was very encouraging um, while I was there. He, he spurred me on. He gave me all the encouragement that um, I needed to go fr from house engineer to freelance mixing engineer. He, said, he suggested I specialize in mixing. Um, by that time, I'd done a few mixes for him. And he said, you, you know, he was very encouraging and supportive. That's cool. Me going out as a freelance mixing engineer. It was either that or he said, get, out the, get the hell out of my studio. It was one of the two. <laughs> <laughs> no, he was good. He was really supportive and encouraging. And, uh, but, but really, the biggest two influences for me and my outlook i suppose is when i was a kid when i was left school i left school very early at 15 14 or 15 something like that with very little minimal education and was looking at being a truck driver for the rest of my life um the one thing i was semi good at at school was art to, to be more accurate it was the only subject i didn't fail so after a few dead-end jobs before I was old enough to drive, because in London at the time, you had to be 18 to drive mm. and, and older to drive a truck, at least drive the type of truck that my dad was driving. Um, so in those, those 
uh, interim years, I got dead end job after dead end job. And so my mum and dad suggested I go to art school. And I, I wasn't that keen, you know, I didn't think I was that great at art and I was right, but it was the only thing I was semi good at at school. So they paid for me to go to art school and I hated art and learning about it and art history and all the things that you have to do at art school. And I was no good at it, but the people I met there were from a different world. Coming from East London, where all your mates have grown up in the same environment with the same restrictions and, and limitations and expectations were all very low, you know. Um, I suddenly was meeting these fantastically interesting people at art school who, the guy who sat next to me in one of the lessons or other, had hitchhiked around the world and he was only 18. Wow. And, 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 but everyone had a story like that. And somebody else had been a roadie for a band that I loved, a James Gang. I, I was big and James Gang weren't very popular in England. Joe Walsh became popular, but James Gang weren't. Great, great band. Superb. And, and I knew James Gang and he was a roadie for James Gang, you know, and, and it was just this eye opening experience, not because of the art, but because of the people that were in art school. And that really, set me down that path of, I want to do something other than drive a truck. You know, I wasn't sure what it was. I thought it was going wow. to be playing in a band, but you know, it became clear after a while that I wasn't good enough to do that. Um, but it, it set me in that, it put me in that mindset, you know? So that was a huge influence. And the other was the other band members in Horizontal Brian. They were, like I said before, they were a little older than me and they'd experienced a lot more of the 60s revolution than I had. I was coming in a bit late. They were in the thick of it. So that was exciting to, to, to live vicariously through them in that way. But just their personalities, their experiences, their intelligence, and they had the same kind of limited education that I'd had, only they'd grown up in Suffolk. Um, but they were intelligent guys and very uh, and they were a great influence on me i, I was a young s uh, slob you know lying my way into their band as a bass player and i learned a hell of a lot from being with those guys and uh i love them they were great they were they, they still are i see them when i go back to england that's so cool man man thank you for sharing that that was really nice that was really you're very lucky that um you're lucky that you from my perspective, you're lucky you had your most people that grow up in that kind of environment when they see other people that are uh, more open minded, more adventurous, have had more opportunities. Myself, I'll give you, I'll take, I'll own that, are not mature enough to look at that through rose tinted lenses. Yeah, I know what you mean. Yeah. And, and you're fortunate that you had, and I think probably in hearing your story, uh, your parents continued optimism. I mean, look, you, here you go. You're, you know, many people in that situation, you know, uh, dad or mom might've said, Hey, look, and you're not good at anything. Get a job. Mm -hmm. Your parents said, Hey man, you know what? Let's I'll pay for you to go to art school. Cause you seem to be good. At, I mean, that's a, that's a, blessing man to be honest with you. i mean that's really and it's only since becoming a parent myself that i realized what a big step that was for them they were they weren't wealthy but they had to they had to pay for that education yeah and unfortunately and i've also in equal measure feel just as bad about this as i feel appreciative of them doing that is that i got kicked out after one year because i wasn't doing the work right so you know, i really let parents down i didn't feel like that at the time um, but I, I do now because of my own kids, not that they let me down, but I would imagine how I'd feel if they did. Uh, I got one daughter in college right now. And if she blows it, I'm going to be pretty, pretty pissed off, you know? Really? You know what? Um, At the time, I, I was too self-centered and focused on my life, you know? Um, but they were pretty... Were you the youngest? Thinking. No, I was the oldest. Just two, me and my sister, that's all there was. Interesting, because as a parent, we have three and I tended to be more upset with my oldest when he 
when in my perception, he had an opportunity or a talent and he didn't use it. But I learned from him that that's not my job. Shame on me, to be honest with you. I learned that my job is not to plan out and have expectations for his life. My job is just to support and love him unconditionally. And I did a better job of that on my second and my third, who's put up with all, put us through all sorts of bullshit, <laughs> even better, you know, because I've learned, you know what, man, this will work out or whatever, but that's not my. Yeah. It's very difficult to stop yourself being a finger wagging parent, you know? Mm. Um, well, especially when you grew up like you did or I did, when it's when you want to say, man, I had a shit in the three degrees outside and, you know, my balls froze literally, you know, and you're opportunities and what, you know, right to waste. But right. No, you yeah. can't push them down a road they don't want to go. Yeah. My, my first daughter, my oldest daughter, um, showed great promise uh, as a pianist, not a flowery classical pianist. She, technically, no, but with a great ear mm. and can play what she hears, you know? And I remember she, I can't remember what age she was, not that old, six or seven, something like that. And I showed her how to play Martha, my dear, Beatles song. Pretty okay. song. So at the age of six or something, she could play Martha, my dear. And it, that piece of music isn't that tricky, but it's very impressive. Yeah. Playing, Cause it's syncopated and everything. Very much. And, um, and it's quite a thing. It's a party piece, you know. And she used to love, I used to take her to the guitar center and there'd be keyboards everywhere. And she would sit and play Martha. <laughs> Somebody spotted, you know, and you could hear people go, that kid is playing Martha, my dear. And that gave her a nice little boost, you know. That's but she cute. let the piano go. That might change now. She's at college. She's just started college. And there's a piano course on offer that she might take. And I think that's a much better way of nurturing the talent whatever talent they have is yeah. to make sure that they're exposed to it and then that's it, all you could do man yeah uh, and she took piano lessons when she was a kid she wasn't really feeling it it was clear that she wasn't in love with it so you can't force them you know no. I mean? and no, now no. it looks like she's going to voluntarily go back to the piano that's she, cool man which downstairs, the, she's always sitting there and tinkling so you know i totally agree with that philosophy very cool. But yeah, your parents were great in that they did that. Yeah, I, I can they, definitely applaud every, everything they did now. Whereas at the time, you're, too, you're just so focused on your own life. It, it's well, like, you don't know anything. Yeah. Everything, everything sucks <laughs> when you're a teenager or a young kid. Hey, uh, three more questions, Tony. I really appreciate your time and thank you so much. I enjoyed talking with you. I hadn't, stuff I hadn't thought about in decades, you know. Well, I'm glad you thought about it. It was very interesting. And thank you for sharing it. Side of this. Oh, that's good. Then that, that makes me happy, man. Then I did my job. That's good. Uh, any any um, interest outside of music? Um, yeah, perhaps not anymore. Um, until recently, I've always been an avid motorcyclist. Oh wow! Both the uh, of the the touring type, right? Jumping on a bike, seeing this amazing country. Um, plus my, my wife and I did our honeymoon on, on a bike. Really? That's cool. Where'd you go? We, had, uh, we did, you know, the touristy thing, but to us, it was incredible. Um, coming from England, uh, yeah. my wife's from England too. And, uh, we jumped on, uh, the, I had a massive touring bike at the time with, I put a five disc CD changer on it. <laughs> and of course it made the bike sit like this. <laughs> And it killed the handling, but it's great. It sounded fantastic. I had a subwoofer in the back. Oh, my God. The most incredible sound system you'd ever heard. Um, but we jumped on that thing, and we rode around all the parks. Monument Valley, uh, Grand Canyon, Zion. You know, the parks are all kind of... Yeah. Area. And uh, we went up to Lake Powell. Fantastic trip. That's in and, Idaho, Lake Powell, isn't it? Uh, no, it's in Arizona, I believe. Okay, okay. It's right by uh, Rainbow Bridge, the famous Rainbow Bridge. Oh, okay. Uh, Ala Hendrix is right on the shores of Lake Powell. I didn't Powell. know that. Very cool. That was a, that's a nice thing to do. 
Uh, it was brilliant. So bike, uh, bikes have played a big part. I mean, in England, I've always had motorbikes, but in England, it's different. You have a motorbike there because you can't afford a car. It's not like kids out here get a car when they're 16. Well, man, I don't know how kids out here afford cars anymore, man. And I, I, even adults, you see a lot of adults driving around in scooters. Yeah, nowadays. you do. Nowadays, it's, it's like, you know. Yeah. But we did. We had no choice. It was a moped. And then mm. if you're lucky, you graduated to a motorbike. So I've always had a bit of a love for them. But in England, the weather just doesn't play with, uh, the, you know, it doesn't play ball with you. And you get soaked and freezing and everything. But out here, when I, when I first realized that I lived here, you know, again, it wasn't a conscious decision. It just evolved from one gig led to another gig. Suddenly I was living in California. And I remember I got paid for a particular gig. And uh, and I went past the motorcycle showroom and there was this thing in the, in the, this vision of motorcycle heaven in the window. And I thought, check, check in the pocket. <laughs> Go in and have a look. And there was this touring bike there and the check went. And, I bought a bike. There. and the next day, Erica hadn't moved out here by then uh, until uh, much later. So I just jumped on that bike and rode everywhere I could find. Just That's you know, cool. Took off fantastic experience and then that morphed into riding sport bikes on the racetrack with a group of friends that was so much fun unfortunately oh, i crashed and that was the last time i rode on a race yeah that would do it for me man I've been on the road since then but not with the same reckless abandon that i did pre-crash great fun though so much fun on the racetrack day so that any, anything else besides that motorbike? not really i mean uh, aside from the uh, uh, bringing two kids into the world, you know. <laughs> uh, outside of music, there's really not time for much more. I hear you, man. Never been uh, a stamp collector or anything, you know. What's the English food you miss the most and your favorite American food? Whoa. That came out of nowhere. I know. Surprised you. I didn't have that on there, but it's always a fun question. Uh, probably shepherd's pie. Oh, okay. Yeah, but I don't know if you guys know what that is. But uh, Ann makes it once. My kids love it. It's funny. Oh, well, my I kids love, my kids it. love all the English food she makes because they grew up eating it. Well, their... most of the food we we uh, we make is brown. But yes, <laughs> I grew up with it, so I love it. But you know, Americans in particular tend to kind of turn their nose up at the brownness of everything that you get over there. It's and and what do you what do you so you miss shepherd's pie? And what do you like most here? Um. Probably cuisine from the other countries. I mean, which uh, one? Mexican. Mexican food. Yeah, everybody tells me how good the Mexican food is out there. I'm going to be at Nam. I have to grab some Mexican while I'm out in California. Yeah, everybody it's, raves about it. I don't know. I, you know, I. It depends on the restaurant, I suppose. I, there's been plenty of American restaurants I've been to that have been great, and some that not so great. Oh yeah, man. Uh, Shepherd's pie. That's funny. Is that do you, when you go back home or if you go back home, do you always eat shepherd's pie? I suppose. I think, see, now it's different because now we have, you know, two grown up daughters and, and everything is tailored to what they want. Most, yeah. you know, yeah. when we go back and see my parents, my mom is still, I mean, she's doing great. She's still on her feet and That's taking great. care of everyone when they come around, when we come around. And mostly it's, well, will the kids eat this if I make it? Yeah, they'll meet it, mom. Don't worry. That's cool. The, you know, the shepherd's pie has fallen down the list of things for my mum to make. As oh, yeah. Gone by, you know. I get that, man. It's all good, though. Hey, and last question, uh, Tony. Biggest change in your personality over the last 10 years and um, how much of that has been intentional and how much is just a natural part of aging? Uh, biggest change? Well, you know, I suppose like everybody, and especially if you have kids, you get a little bit wiser. It's not always evident, but inside I feel a little bit wiser having done that job, you know. Both girls now are, are kind of bordering on adults. So, you know, you, there's an aspect of that that makes you go, okay, job done. Hell yeah. And it'll, it'll get better as they get older. Lifelong, it's a lifelong vocation. So yeah. I'm not fooling myself, but it's all great though. Um, I suppose I'm a lot grumpier than I used to be. <laughs> really? More than I used to be, than I used to do. Like get off the grass kind of grumpy? 
Yeah, I don't know. Finding things to grumble about in general, whether it be. Yeah, I don't know. I can't think of an example, to be honest. So it's not that acute, but I noticed on occasion the grumble factor is less uh, tolerant. Yeah, less tolerant. I hear you. But is there anything, what, anything that you didn't, anything you regret doing or regret not doing? Right. Yes, definitely. The, the one thing I regret, and this might serve uh, to help somebody else to coming into a career that may end up um, being of repute in some way or other, is that I really regret not having taken any photographs whatsoever of the people I work with. Interesting. And I deeply regret that. Um, I didn't really care about it much until I had kids, but not, I mean, they don't really care much about my careers. They're not that impressed. You know? Right. They're, kids aren't. You're just dad. Yeah. Just dad. And you know, for God's sake, don't wear those trousers when you go outside, dad. <laughs> That's about as much attention as I get. But, um, but I wish I'd have got a collection of photos with all the people we've been talking about. Yeah. Nice for when they're older, you know, cause those people will be legendary by then. And it would be nice to say, Oh yeah. You know, Joey interesting. Was, That's uh, a good point, man. So be the, you know, the lowly engineer bugging the artist for a photo. But now I realize that everybody does that. And yeah. I go to other people, you know, musician friends, houses, and they've all got studios and on the walls are all the people that they've been with, you know, and, and I haven't got one. I, I did have one photo taken with the B-52s, but it's me with a gang of people and the B-52s are in there. You know, I worked on a B-52s album. Old? When? Old or new? Uh, oh, old, very okay. old. It was the album. It was the first album I did after leaving Il Pai. And the first album I did as a freelance engineer. And it was in New York. It was the first time I'd been to New York. So I was on cloud nine. You know, yeah, I'm sure. New York to work with the B-52s. It was fantastic. Um, unfortunately, it was the album right after Ricky Wilson had died. And okay. Ricky was uh, kind of a pivotal member of the band as far as the writing went. And uh, so they were a bit lost on the writing front. We did have a single from that album. It was called Summer of Love. It was kind of a minor hit. Um, but the album was called Bouncing Off the Satellites. And it was great fun to work on that record because those people are so much fun to be with. They're highly entertaining, really, really nice people. And it was funny. They all, at the time, they all lived in the same house. It was uh, they're from Georgia? Yeah. Yeah, that's yeah. right. Right. They lived in New York at the time. And, uh, and they all lived together. That's so wild. Like friends, you know, the TV show. Wow. Uh, that's got to be tough, living, working, touring. They they really took care of uh, of me and the producer. The producer at the at the time was Tony Mansfield, and Tony and I had worked on a few records, and um, and we were on the B fifty twos one together. And they really took care of us in a fantastic way. You know, uh, they were great guys, great guys, and love them. Yes, very so, cool, man. So take pictures. That's a good idea. Uh, that's my biggest regret. I, I encourage anyone moving into you know a new career in the entertainment industry um that may or may not bring them into uh, into contact with somebody who has you know some element of fame or reputation that you know you yeah enjoy. and get a photo with them they don't mind they really don't mind <laughs> it's, it's funny i have uh every time someone comes through town here we usually meet and i almost never get a photo yeah and my wife's like did you get a photo and i'm like yeah, you know i don't want if i go out to and i don't meet everybody but the people i like i do and i always like you know i don't want someone to feel like okay i need you as a prop for my social media exactly that's very well put that's exactly how i felt and that's the reason i didn't do it but I yeah wish yeah, interesting. I'm going to take that up because I think what I might do is like I took a photo, Greg Martin from the Kentucky Headhunters was in town. We hung out. We had barbecue. We spent like most of the day together. But I took a photo of him for me. Yeah. I didn't I didn't. Post, so I think I'll do that because I don't post. I don't really care that it, like I don't get off on somebody. I mean, sure, it might look impressive. I don't care about that shit. You know, oh, this is me with, that's not, if that's what you want to listen to the show because you see yeah. a photo of me, that's not. That was that was always my perspective until I had kids. Then suddenly it became valuable. 
Yeah, I think so, man. That's a good Nothing idea. Now I'm going to be like hundreds of fucking photos. Uh, <laughs> hey, man, uh, let me tell people uh, where they can, if they, somebody wants to work with you. And thank you, man. You've been really great with your time. I really appreciate it. I oh, hope I you feel. Any of it, Craig. It's been oh. a lot of fun, actually. And a lot of things have come up that I haven't thought about in years and years. And it's been in thoroughly enjoyable. That's cool, man. Thank you. We got to get, this is the not a British interview. I have some Brits on. You know, I had Joan Armitrading on here. Really? Yeah. And she was great, Armor man. Plating, we used to call her. What's that? We used to call her Joan Armour Plating, but that was just in my oh. bed. Everybody, everything. Yeah. She was lovely, man. Re really lovely woman. Yeah. Um, okay. So let me tell you, if you are a band or an artist and you are interested in having one of the most successful mixers in the history of music uh, working with you, um, let me give you... Tony, it's Tony Phillips. I'm going to give you his email address. And also, well, let me give you his email address first. It's Tony Flips, F-L-I-P-S. But it's Tony Phillips is, is Tony's full name. Tony Flips, F-L-I-P-S, at dslextreme.com. All right? Tony Flips at dslextreme.com. And email him. And depending upon the services you're looking for, he might be more affordable than you're thinking. Okay? Um, so if you're looking for mixing guidance or someone to mix your music, uh, with an incredible freaking track record, uh, just email them, give it a shout and let them know what your project is, maybe what kind of experience you've had or what you're looking for, what your frustrations are. And this way he can get back to and let you know if the things that you're looking to accomplish or the problems or objectives you have, um, are something that he is interested in doing. And, you know, then you go from there, maybe hop on a call or something like that, but be as detailed as you can. So he could respond appropriately and not, uh, you know, everybody be on the same page. Um, that's it. Anything else that you, I could promote for you. Can I sell you any way, Tony? No. I mean, if I had a t-shirt, I'd send you one, but I don't. You see, <laughs> to the same category as lousy at networking, you know, here yeah. I am great opportunity what have i got nothing but it's all good you know i like to think the work speaks for itself maybe yeah play out we'll see it's it's all good it's all good good man well thank you for your time hang on let me wrap up really sincerely thank you man you're, you're a lovely guy i'm glad we got to connect right. and uh i will tell ann that you love shepherd's pie <laughs> Everybody, thank you so much for listening. If you enjoyed this, please share it on your social media channels again. Uh, and thanks very much to Tony Phillips for spending all this time with us. And if again, I'll give you Tony's address. If you're looking to get involved and you want to have, talk with Tony about mixing your record, what's involved, um, just shoot him an email, man. He's a lovely guy to talk to. And if nothing else, you'll have a very pleasant conversation. It's Tony Flips, F-L-I-P-S, Tony, T-O-N-Y, obviously at dslextreme.com uh, and again depending upon what you're looking for he might be more affordable than you're thinking just send him an email let him know what's going on um, and that's it and outside of that most important remember that happiness is a choice so please do choose wisely be nice go play your guitar and have fun till next time peace and love everybody i'm out and tony thank you for everything you're welcome craig <laughs>